Okay, we're recording. Go ahead, Andy. Thank you. Okay, I'm calling the Finance Committee meeting to order on May 17, 2022. It's uh, just about three minutes after 9 a.m. And for those of us in the council and the staff who are present, it's our second meeting of the day. Um, and I need to uh, uh, recognize the members of the Finance Committee and make sure that all members of the Finance Committee can um, hear me and be heard. So, Lynn? Present. Uh, Bob? I'm here. Matt? Present. Bernie? Present. Michelle? Here. Kathy? Here. And Alicia. So I think the one person who is not present. And uh, I think that we have a quorum of the council. This has also been posted as a council meeting. It has been, but we don't have a quorum yet. I believe we only have six members of the council. Okay. So you, you keep tabs of that. And uh, let me know um, if the... Uh, if we do get to a quorum and you need to stop and call the meeting to order, I'll um, just let me know. And just for everybody's uh, information uh, who's not been in a, one of these meetings this year, the way that we proceed is that um, there's a brief introduction that um, each of the department uh, makes to give us sort of an overview and the critical issues that you would like us to be aware of. And uh, we've assigned one member of the uh, council who's responsible for each of the areas and that person gets to ask questions first. And then I recognize all members of the committee and all members of the council in order that hands are raised um, to ask questions. Um, I don't uh, distinguish in any fashion. So with that, Lynn, keep your hands up. Uh, we, we now have a quorum of the council. So given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm going to call the ad hoc, I'm sorry, the committee of the whole meeting of the council to order. I need to check to make sure that uh, the additional counselors can hear and be heard. Um, let me just look quickly. Uh, Dorothy Pam. I can hear. Jennifer Taub. Do you want me to say? I just say you can hear us and we can hear yes, you. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Anna Devlin Gothier. Good morning. I can hear you. Mandy Jo Haneke. I'm present. Thank you. Done. Okay, so uh, could you put the agenda up again for just a moment, please? And then uh, so I want to do two things for having the agenda. First of all, just to remind everybody that pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, uh, this meeting is being conducted by a remote means members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is uh, permitted, but we've made every effort to make to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. Um, I will have the agenda put back up later again in the agenda, but I want to go through the first part really quickly. Um, there, uh, we're going to um, be going directly into public safety. Uh, the second item only is on the agenda to in case there's general budget issues that people from the committee raised during the meeting, but. Uh, it's not specifically planned for an allocation of time. So the next items are public safety followed by the community services sections that are listed. 
on the agenda that you see on the screen. And we will take public comment, uh, but it's the process of the committee generally to take public comment later in the meeting after we've had presentations. So with that, um, I think we can uh, proceed. Uh, and, oh, and I guess one other thing I will just say is before, and that is there will be um, at least one item I will take up as uh, unanticipated business and just follow up on last night's meeting. Uh, Chief Livingstone, welcome. And I uh, turn this over to you and let you be the one to introduce others from the department and uh, uh, people that you otherwise supervise and uh, as we go through it. Uh, so, but please proceed and good morning. Good morning, Andy, thank you. And <clears throat> good morning to the committee members and to the members of the town council present. Uh, with me today is Captain Ron Young, who's our administrative captain, and Captain Gabe Ting, who oversees operations. <clears throat> also, um, Mike Curtin from the Communications Center is also with us to answer any questions that you might have specific to the Communications Center. Um, Andy, if it's okay with you, uh, is it okay if I go in reverse order, animal welfare, communications, and then police? It's um, We've kind of traditionally done that just because it gets some of the smaller items out of the way. And that way Mike Curtin can get back to communication center because he does have dispatch responsibilities as well. Oh, that's fine. So um, Carol didn't want to join us today on Zoom. She's not a big Zoom fan. Uh, and she's an entity of one, I think. I, I don't think she needs any introduction, but um, she didn't have any specific orders given to me to give the you or any specific stuff that isn't in her um, her package, her budget packaging. So I would just say that, you know, Carol continues to be the sole person responsible for all things uh, related to animal welfare issues. And that includes, you know, responding to calls for complaints, um, animal bites, you know, patrolling the areas of the you know, areas of town where there's frequently dog um, issues and that sort of thing. And she does all of that very well. And she responds to uh, pretty much anything people ask of her. Uh, everybody has her cell phone number and she points out to me and she continues to do a fabulous job. Um, just going down her list for recent accomplishments. Um, and Carol is very, very proud of most of the, all of these actually. Um, you know, her annual inspections of the farms. I don't know if a lot of people recognize that, but she is part of her responsibilities. That she goes to every farm that's licensed in the town and does inspections annually and makes sure that um, things are up to speed. And um, I think most of you are probably aware of the recent incident we had at a, a farm down on Southeast Street. That was not one of the ones that was on her list. Um, and uh, as that most people are aware, that is in a legal proceeding now, but Carol did an outstanding job specific to that farm uh, when it was brought to her attention. Um, you know, she continues to have a high priority of licensing all the dogs in towns, which is sometimes difficult because a lot of times students will bring animals with them and they are her responsibility. But, you know, the fact that she gets about 85 to 90 percent um, of the animals that we're aware of in town, dogs license is a pretty good job on her part. Um, for her key challenges and long range objectives, you know, she's forever, you know, do, dealing with the licensing of, of dogs and the inspections of the farm. So that's something that she continues to do um, throughout the year. Um, you know, it seems like she's receiving more and more complaints for um, unleashed dogs off of the conservation areas in particular and other uh, areas like Groff Park and Mill River Rec areas. So she patrols those areas pretty frequently whenever she can. So that's part of what she does and it's part of what her key challenges are as well. Um, she always wants me to make sure that I continue to add in that part of the challenges and long range objectives for her is going to be the um, Preparation for a recession plan. She's always threatening that she's going to leave me and, and retire, but um, you know I'm not too too overly concerned with that. So 
Um, for prior year objectives, um, you know, we do continue to look for um, membership into our, uh, we call it a regional dog shelter. We have uh, ourselves, the town of Northampton uses our services there and the town of Hadley currently does. Both Hadley and Northampton are also in the process though of looking at starting up their own dog shelters. So, um, you know, we'll continue to search and look out for, for um, membership into a regional approach. But uh, as, you, as probably you've read, uh, other municipalities are looking at, at starting up their own dog shelters and animal shelters. So that'll be a continued um, year objective. And she has done a phenomenal job every year about placing the placement of an, animals that come to the shelter. If they're strays or people just can no longer take care of their pets. She's very, very proud of that. She has 100% placement. Um, I think every one of our police officers that owns a dog probably has gotten it from Carol. So, um, you know, she, she has a, a way of swaying people to become animal owners and uh, she does a fantastic job with that. Um, other than that, um, you know, uh, her budget is mostly her full-time benefited position. Um, there's a little bit of overtime uh, and, and fuel costs and maintenance costs, but um, really that's about it. So if there are any questions specific to animal welfare, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Or I can follow up with Carol if I don't know the answer to those questions. Scott, there was one question about um, that Kathy sent in about- Oh, yes. Um, about the, Carol working with health department staff. Yep, so um, the question uh, was presented, uh, do we have one? We have one person for the function of animal control officer. And in the news recently, does the person work directly with the health department staff? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, previous, uh, the previous health director, Julie Fetterman and an outstanding relationship. Jen Brown and Carol have an outstanding relationship. Uh, typically a health department will reach out to her when they get complaints. It's usually complaint driven and um, Carol works very closely with the health department when we get issues with that. The incident down on Southeast Street was more at the state level. Um, you know, that wasn't something that our health department would have been prepared to deal with and handle with. So that's why the MSPCA was brought in uh, with my detective bureau to work on that specific case. But generally speaking, um, Carol has a really great relationship with both um, Jen Brown and previously with Julie Fetterman in the health department. Mm -hmm. uh, Alicia Walker has joined. You need to, as finance committee. Oh. Yeah, Alicia, hi, good morning. Uh, just want to make sure that you can hear us. Hi, everyone. Yes, I can hear you all. Thank you. Excellent. So are there um, any questions on animal welfare? If not, um, we'll take it back to the chief to proceed to the next part of the budget, which I think was going to be a dispatch. And Mike Curtin has joined us and um, I'll let him jump in um, probably in a hurry because he really is the expert on this. But, you know, the communication center uh, continues to operate uh, at 12 full time positions, including Mike. So Mike has dual responsibilities as both the director of the communication center, but he also has dispatch responsibilities. Uh, as well, so he kind of wears many hats up there. Um, we are at 12 um, full-time positions. We have been notified by two of our dispatchers that they will be retiring in the next fiscal year. So we are currently in the process of a recruitment. Um, matter of fact, I have a couple of people that are coming in later today to have discussions about potentially filling those jobs. Um, so, Mike, I'd let you kick it off now if you want to jump in. Sure. Thanks, Chief. So, I guess probably the easiest way is just to kind of follow up with what Chief did with animal welfare. We'll go through our accomplishments. Um, Chief, did you forward my answers to Kathy, the question she had specific? Okay. So I did I not. We're going to do those verbally. Sure. Okay. So, um, our recent accomplishments is something we have to do every year, but um, we have to maintain our state certifications as emergency dispatchers, which requires a certain amount of continuing education credits, have to meet uh, certain requirements that they have. 
Uh, we also applied for a couple of grants, which are uh, integral to our operations, a training grant, which we received from the state for 19,000, which helps take care of that training, pay for the majority of costs. There's only a few incidentals, but um, very little that the state training grant doesn't pick up that allows the dispatchers to keep their certifications. Uh, without a certification, you can't answer a 911 phone, which basically means you can't do the job. And we also re uh, received a support incentive grant for $133,000. Uh, we use that to pay for a full-time position with benefits and the additional is used to supplement um, a pretty extensive overtime budget that we have. Uh, in FY22, we were still um, serving as one of the two regional hazmat material, uh, hazardous material dispatch centers in the state. Uh, participated in some ongoing efforts to investigate public safety responses uh, with the towns and the, the uh, colleges. We were able to, through COVID, to maintain our um, allotted staffing. We met all our training through the COVID issues. And we also uh, were able to apply for and procure a lot of COVID personal protection equipment from me with the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. Um, our long range objectives are always to uh, maintain the health standards while continuing to staff a 24 seven operation. Um, even more challenging, obviously, with COVID. Uh, we work with the state 911 department to uh, maintain our necessary training, uh, to maintain our state certifications. The state has a tendency to tweak some of these things every now and then to add some trainings, to add some additional layers. So we uh, are always staying on top of that. Um, we are always struggling to maintain our staffing levels. Uh, we have to balance this with uh, contractual obligations for leave. Um, we were fortunate enough, a couple of our, our members had some children um, this year, but that does lead to uh, some openings that have to be filled. Um, sometimes it leads to some forced overtime, but um, we were able to meet those challenges. Um, we have some essential in-person meetings, something like this today that with the COVID and the CDC regulations, some of our training, CPR training, things like that have to be done in person. So that was a little bit more challenging during the during these times. Um, and we're still looking at uh, a regional dispatch, anybody that might be interested in partnering up, trying to um, merge some centers. We haven't had the, the best of luck with this, but um, we start, are still looking at it. Uh, prior year objectives, um, uh, one of them to meet the state requirements to maintain our certifications that was accomplished, uh, to address the need for proper staffing levels, to provide coverage for known contractual leaves. Um, we're always able to accomplish that. And again, sometimes that leads to forced overtime, uh, making people work when they really don't want to, but um, we have to maintain a minimum of two people on duty at all times. So it does happen. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at doing, we have myself as the uh, supervisor, we have one lead dispatch position, which provides some after hour supervision. Um, we're looking to add a second lead dispatch position to provide even more uh, after hours or hours that I'm not here supervision. And I'm the first lead dispatcher is gonna have to start spending some hours with me learning some of the administrative tasks uh, right now, it's Jason Rushford. He does an excellent job with the day-to-day -day operations, but there's um, a lot of things with the grants and payroll and things like that, which uh, he needs to spend some time working with me, which would kind of leave some of these after-hour shifts not necessarily supervised by so many communications. We do have the uh, luxury of having a good relationship with the police and fire departments where um, some of the questions that pop up can be answered by those personnel. Um, sometimes I have to be called after hours to answer some things. Uh, and we are just finishing up. We're kind of waiting on the new phone system. I know the rest of the town has the new phones. We're waiting on the new phones and public safety um, to fully equip our backup communication center, which is what up at the North Station. So we're always looking to keep that uh, location up to standards if we need to, for some reason, evacuate the police department where we're located, uh, which gives us capability of operating everything except 911 phones. Um, we have a 
process in place, but we can't get uh, replacement 911 phones up at the, the uh, backup center North Station, but everything else up there is in good shape. Um, upcoming objectives, I know I keep coming back to this, but it's uh, critical, our training and our meet the state requirements to maintain our certifications. Um, you know, there's always new trainings coming down the, the pike and it's important for us to stay on top of those. Um, we're always looking to uh, to address our staffing levels, provide the proper coverage. Um, still hoping, and we're in discussions about filling the second lead dispatch position to provide those uh, the after hour supervision. Um, we're going to be upgrading the backup communication center as new technology becomes available, new radios, um, some new technology that we may be able to put up there to make sure that that location is, is good to go in case of a, a circumstance where we'd have to evacuate the police department. Um, one of our objectives is going to be integrate the uh, CREST program into our dispatching uh, protocols. We've got a really good start on that. Um, Got a few things to button up, but um, we will be ready to go with that when uh, the Crest responders are ready to um, hit the streets. And we're always looking at uh, recruiting and interviewing and retention. It's very difficult in the communications field. It's a, it's a uh, tough profession to keep staff on board for several reasons. And that's it for me for right now. Okay, thank you. Sean, were there any questions that uh, you yeah. Just... yeah, do you want me to put them on the screen or do you want me to read them? And Or, or if you have them, uh, Mike, no. if you wanted to run through them. I do. I'm going to switch over to okay. um, the response I sent to Chief, but I'll uh, go through. These are, are Kathy's questions. So the first question was, uh, call trends have been down with COVID. What has been an experience year to date for FY22? So at this point, our call volume is only up 1% uh, from 21. That's when we were starting to come out of the uh, UMass issues over COVID. We are up 7.5% from the 2020 numbers. Um, that was as of yesterday. Um, do you want me to give some time if there's any further questions on that or you just want me to go uh, through the- Why don't you go through these and then, because there's um, some other counselors with hands up. So let me go through these quickly and then we'll go over to the other questions. Okay. Um, there was a question about what is a business line call and uh, can these also be calls for assistance? So basically a business line call is any call that results in us either dispatching or uh, sending down to our station officer. So it's any call for service or assistance that does not come over our 911, what's called an answering point unit. So it's any call for service, at least in our budget, when you're looking at that number, it's any call for service that we didn't get um, called over the 911 line to, uh, to dispatch on. Next question is, what is the difference between an EMS call and emergency medical dispatch? So emergency medical dispatch, those are the, the medical pre-arrival instructions that dispatchers provide to callers. Um, we provide those instructions until a higher level of medical, medical care is on scene, usually a paramedic. Um, an EMS call is, is an emergency medical call. So some EMS calls, we don't end up providing emergency medical dispatch pre-arrival instructions for. And this can occur when there's a higher level of medical care. There's a doctor or registered nurse or nurse practitioner or a paramedic. There's a higher level of medical care on scene. Um, we defer to do the people on scene to take care of the, the patient. Um, and sometimes the callers, it's either an alarm company calling in and they're not with the patient or we get calls from people remotely calling for help. And if they're not there, uh, emergency medical dispatch is kind of uh, limited on what we can do. Um, have, the next question is, have uh, protocols been developed or in process for referral to CREST staff when in place? And best guess on share of calls. So we are pretty far along in the process. We're waiting on the final answer to what type of calls CREST will be initially responding to. Um, we have a pretty good idea, it just needs to be made official. Um, the, our current protocols will be, have to be updated or tweaked a little bit to include uh, the CREST response. Um, some of it's on a, a technology side where our record system, we have to make sure that we're tracking what CREST is doing. Um, we're currently discussing a lot of 
parallel responses with Crescent PD or Crescent the Fire Department to start, meaning that um, while this program is getting going, there's going to be some things that we're going to send Cress and an officer to begin with, just to kind of see how it works out. Um, I'm sure those will um, be changing a little bit as time goes by. Uh, once Cress has its uh, standard operating pro protocols or their SLPs in place, we'll integrate them into our operations. Same way that we integrate the police department and fire department's standard operating uh, protocols into our protocols and guidelines. So we'll be taking our lead from Cress on some things. If there's if they'd like to do certain things um, in a certain way, we'll see. We'll integrate what they'd like to do in the into our protocols as long as um, it doesn't cause any issues or um, things like that. Initially. I was just running some figures. It looks like Crest will respond to about 10% of the calls that we take. Uh, the majority of these will probably be that parallel type response where they're going with the police or fire department to start. But this doesn't take, uh, does not include any type of self-initiated activity that the Crest program may generate. So in talking with Earl, a lot of the things that they'll be doing will be kind of self-initiated. We'll be documenting them, but they'll be letting us know what they're doing. So. Um, the 10% number, that's kind of existing calls that we're looking at right now. But that's, uh, again, it's a guess, and we'll have a much better idea of six months from now. Uh, any concerns with staffing? Uh, yes. Nationwide emergency dispatchers, it's a critical staffing level. Um, the normal dispatcher career is between seven or three to seven years, depending on what you're looking at. It's stress, it's hours, it's uh, Pay, pay level, those are the contributing factors to the turnover and uh, difficulty sometimes in recruiting and retaining staff. In town, uh, our staffing is in okay shape right now. Again, we do have uh, two retirements coming up. And what we always have to be cognizant of is when we have a retirement, we run into issues of more forced overtime. So if we have this open shifts for months and more people start getting forced. We reach this burnout thing and people say, no, just not worth doing it. And it can have a domino effect. So we have to be very careful to, to avoid that. Um, just in talking to the HR department, we're trying to get more of a jump start. When we know we have leaves coming up, get started a little bit earlier in that recruitment process, even with the training process, um, get people tr almost fully trained. So when somebody does leave, we have a serviceable uh, body that we can plug in there. Um, it's, it's been a challenge. Obviously, that's a fiscal challenge when you're carrying extra staff for a little bit, but it's necessary to stay ahead of the game. And those were all the questions um, from Kathy's list. Okay. Um, let me just ask Lynn real quickly. Um, you had your hand up first, but uh, if it's a real dispatch related question, I want to go to Kathy because it was her. It's her area and then come back. It's only related to Pam Rooney, who has joined the meeting to make sure she can hear us and we can hear her. I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kathy, is there any follow up that you have? No, for I just wanted to, to those who are um, wondering where my, where the origin of my questions on page 133 of the budget book is where there are all the statistics on the communication center. So that's what I was going down and looking at the trends um, and trying to understand, you know, COVID, COVID distributed thing. You can see some drop-offs, but um, it's this high volume. So, so it was just, providing a context. Thank you very much for Mike for your answers because I was trying to understand to what extent um, you're anticipating and I know Earl will be coming on as part of this and you can't know this, but once Cress is up with staff, will that result in potentially an increase in volume that people know they can call for help? Will there be a separate line they're calling in? So that difference between what your business line in is, is what your emergency, that's where I was just looking at what do we have to anticipate for staffing? And I guess that's, uh, we'll know that a year from now when we start staffing up and understanding how much of it's teamwork and the current volume can be handled. So, so thank you for the answers, but that 
that's what I just want people to be able to see what I was looking at, Andy, on um, they, they provided a very useful table. And you can see the pre COVID numbers in some areas were a lot higher than the volume they've been handling recently, which was why I asked about staffing, you know, because there may have been uh, less stress on staff for a short amount of time, although COVID put its own kind of stress. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So the, the hands that I see up right now in the order that I believe they uh, raise their hands are Bernie, Dorothy, Mandy, and uh, Lynn. Uh, Bernie? I'm gonna switch my icon, thanks, thanks Andy. Um, <clears throat> two questions, somewhat different. The first question is, uh, what uh, what employee assistance uh, protocols or services are in place now? And uh, the uh, dispatch center is subjected to a, a considerable amount of uh, and a variety of pressures. And so uh, I, I'm interested in knowing because I can't tell from the budget how employees are supported in their emotional and physical health. That's one question. And the second question is, uh, people don't always tell the difference between UMass and the town of Amherst. And I was curious as to how, um, uh, what kind of an impact uh, it has on duplicate calls when uh, uh, our dispatch might get calls that are really intended for UMass and vice versa. Sure, so um, as far as employee assistance, we do have the town EAP, EAP program. Uh, we do trainings on stress management, uh, healthy lifestyles. The HR department is always sending out things for the wellness program which several of the dispatches are partaking in. Uh, it's physically, it's a pretty sedentary job. So it is a concern um, with lack of motion. Um, we don't have the ability to leave the center uh, to take a 30 minute walk. We don't have lunch breaks. Um, so that can be trying at times. Um, we have a, a peer a counseling program with members of uh, the police and fire departments for any critical incidents that happen. They're always including the dispatchers who are on duty. Um, those trainings or those uh, debriefings are usually available for anybody that would like to attend, but we always um, really push the people that were directly involved into attending things like that. Uh, the, the fire department has a chaplain that is of service anytime that anybody needs to speak to them um, 24 seven. It's, it's amazing what he does. So we do our best for the well-being, for the mental well-being. Um, it's a lot of our training, and a lot of it is, is uh, venting to coworkers um, to realize that you know we can do a lot, but we're limited in what we can do. We're not on scene. Um, there's calls that stick with people, so um, we do our very best in-house to take care of that. As far as the UMass and Town of Amherst question. Um, we are uh, pretty proficient at determining whether the call is ours or on UMass campus. There's not a whole lot of things that are uh, dual responses where we're not sure who they are. Car accidents sometimes they'll be at the corner of Mass Ave and North Pleasant. You may get a UMass officer and a um, Amherst officer show up for it before they can figure out jurisdiction. But as far as the noise complaints and things like that, um, the Majority of calls that come in are the town of Amherst property and the town of Amherst police department are responding to them. The fire and the EMS stuff, uh, we often get the calls for the EMS side of it where we will start the Amherst fire department over there and they will notify UMass that the uh, fire department's gonna be on campus and then they'll respond along with it. Um, as far as if there's a question in there and I think I saw it in some of Kathy's questions as far as the police, on how much of the activity um, that we're dispatching on is generated by uh, the student population in town. Um, that would be some, it would take some time to get into some good stats on that, but I could throw a guess out there that 95% of our noise complaints are generated by student activity. Thank you. Thank you. Bernie, anything else? No, thank, thank you very much. Okay, Dorothy, hi. Okay, so my question was about uh, a career ladder. Um, where do you, um, people who work in dispatch, do they go into the police department? Um, 
And also what are your relationships with say schools like Holyoke Community College and their criminal justice program? Do you have interns? Um, so I'm just curious to know uh, where people go in the job. And that's, that's got to do something to do with retention, I imagine. Absolutely, and uh, thank you. Um, one of the things with the career ladder, and this is this lead dispatcher position, um, until we got this up and running going on two years ago, there really was no clear uh, career ladder within dispatch. Um, it was dispatchers and myself, dispatch supervisor. The career ladder aspect I think is critical in retention. Um, it gives the employee that wants to go above and beyond, it gives them something to strive for. There are a certain amount of any job, there's a certain amount of people that love their job the way it is and are happy with it and want to leave when they go home for the day, try to forget about the job or till they're at work next. Um, there's other people that would prefer some type of advancement opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I, I, again, pushing for this second, this, this second lead position, just kind of provide that, that coverage we need. Um, the Hoyle Community College aspect, a lot of the criminal justice, most of those um, students are looking to go into uh, police work. Um, we don't necessarily, we haven't had people kind of cross over from our dispatch center to go into police work, but it does happen mm -hmm. in some larger centers. Uh, there's some centers where uh, to get into the police field and not really in Massachusetts, but I'm thinking Texas, California, where the candidates actually have to spend a year in dispatch before they they can move up into the, the police candidate um, section. But that's not the way that it works in, in our, our center. Um, we do have a certain amount of uh, dispatchers, I think uh, three dispatchers that have second jobs in fire service, mm -hmm. um, either usually a part-time or on-call um, type basis. So I'll uh, make that two, we've one left. So, you know, a, a career ladder would be a great thing. I wish that I had it moving up, um, but that's just kind of the way things are set up here. Would you recommend um, future uh, wanting people wanting to be police officers serve some time in dispatch? Absolutely. I mean, right now, the, the new police recruits and um, sometimes the fire department, they'll send their recruits, the police department does all the time to sit in dispatch for a while to kind of get our perspective on things. Yeah. Um, it's, I do think it's valuable training in the same way that the dispatchers will do ride alongs with the police department and fire department to see the type of things that they have to do. Um, puts a face to a voice. A lot of times, um, you know, we don't see people as often as we would like to. Well, thank you very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Mandy. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Kathy, for asking some of the questions I had. There's one that wasn't covered, and hopefully it's an easy answer, which is we are a regional dispatch, hazmat dispatch center, which is great, but I'm curious whether the state um, provides some funds for us to maintain that as a regional hazmat dispatch center, and if so, how much? So we are no longer going to be that regional dispatch center. Um, they, the state has moved that responsibility to MEMA. They have four dispatchers on duty, so they've moved that responsibility. There was funding that came through, uh, it went into a revolving fund that uh, accounting kind of managed. I believe it was $10,000 a year, but the, uh, the uh, Department of Fire Services who runs the hazardous material dispatch, they discovered that they could get it done for nothing from MEMA, uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Emergency Management. So they, they moved that direction. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Do you have anything else? Okay, because your hand was still up outside. Lynn? This is a theme you're going to hear from me periodically, and it doesn't just apply to this dispatch. The time to be thinking about an evaluation system that will collect all of the data that tells us how Chris is doing and what has changed is now, because you need some baseline data which we need before we start. And then of course we wanna see the data as it grows. This is an impressive program. I think we're off to a great start, uh, but I do wanna urge and ask whether we are already 
looking at evaluation models that will bring in all of the disparate data from places like dispatch, um, everything to uh, you know individual stories that then are viewed for content analysis, et cetera. Um, I mean, I could start with that, then Mike, you could probably jump on and maybe even Earl. Uh, Lynn, that's a great question. What, we're what we found out, um, because, you know, in the end, we are the keeper of records here in the police department. And what we're finding is uh, with our people from IT, the types of questions that people want answered, we don't have, we don't always have the data for. And our system here, IMC, that we use in both police and fire is 30 years old. So we have begun the process of looking for a new system, both for uh, dispatch collection of data, um, you know, everything that we do as far as report writing and that, looking at a new system and I put it in, I think the FY24 line item request for capital and it's expensive, you know, the most recent um, quote we got was in the $350,000 range, and that's for police only. So uh, what we found uh, when, when we started working with Earl to see how we could start the data collection with the Crest team is that it, it's not easy to do. Um, the things that the Crest department's gonna be looking for are capable of doing for them with the current system. So working with IT, we're kind of cob jobbing some stuff together initially, but we're going to need to come up with a new system and we're going to need to do that as soon as possible. Uh, Mike, anything else? I think you covered it, Chief. We can gather raw numbers for the Crest team. We can know how many calls they were dispatched on, how many calls they self-initiated, um, some very basic type of calls that they're addressing. But um, when they start digging down into the data, our record system is not very proficient at that. Lynn, anything else? Yeah, I actually wonder whether there might be, um, given the national interest in the kind of program that we're developing in Amherst, whether there might be a way to upgrade um, the system faster and actually implement a more professional evaluation um, that would bring in other factors besides just the raw data. I, I just really urge that given the nature of this program, given the um, leadership that I believe Amherst is taking in this area, and given our own interest in wanting to have proof of concept that we really look at this now, not later. Thank you. John, did I uh, say? Yeah, I was just gonna say that um, some of what you described, Lynn, is what is um, uh, gonna be paid for from either our one-time uh, ARPA allocation or the DPH grant had a big piece on evaluation and there's a, a strong focus on evaluation that Earl can speak to later um, from that grant. Well, thank you. Michelle? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have kind of a multi-part question. Um, so I was a little surprised to hear the 10%. Um, it seemed lower than I had anticipated, and I understand that this is evolving. So, um, but I, I do have three questions um, related to that. So how was that quantified, that 10%? How did you reach that number? Um, and how many calls does that equate to per week or per month, just to give a better sense of what 10% means? Um, and then also, do the number of current responders that we have proposed for this meet the needs of the 10% that we're expecting right now? So those are my three questions. Um, so I can start, Michelle, thanks for the question. Um, and you're probably not gonna like the answer only because, you know, working with Earl and, and Gabe and, and Ronnie and Mike Curtin and Timmy Nelson and his crew, you know, Mike started tracking types of calls months ago. 
about, hey, would this be a call that Crest could handle? And, you know, we would check off yes. And so it's been it's kind of, and it's really just kind of written down uh, on paper about what types of calls Crest could handle and, you know, what sort of calls we might need a parallel response on. Something simple like, okay, we all anticipate that the Crest team will be handling a, most of our um, calls associated with homelessness, right? Um, that's that's kind of a no-brainer. Okay, that makes sense until we start thinking about some of our homeless individuals. And we know that some of them are, um, well, that quite frankly, they're violent. And that's not something I would feel comfortable having a Crest member go to alone. So, you know, I guess the simple question is we, we have an idea of the types of calls we want them to go to, but we also know it's not as simply cut and dry as they're going to handle all homelessness issues, they're going to handle all mental health calls, they're going to handle all, you know, I think it's going to be a lot of communication between Earl and his members uh, and the dispatch center, quite frankly, and there's then there's going to be a lot of communication between the police officers and the Crest members, because I think at some point police officers are going to get dispatched to a call and they're going to be like, this is something Crest can handle. So they'll call and say Crest should handle this. And the in reverse, Crest is going to go to a call and they're like, yeah, this doesn't, we don't want to be here. We need police to respond to this. So I think that's the type of calls we're going to see at least for the first six months, probably a year. Um, Earl or Mike or, or Gabe, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, what I would like to just add is we're standing up, right? Right now, Crest has one employee. It's me. Um, so part of what, when we talk about the 10% or the smaller numbers at the beginning, they're the reality. Um, you know, I'm going to need to get folks confident and I'm going to need to be able to trust them, not just for safety, but to make sure that we're competent when we go places. Um, Lynn, to, to what you talked about earlier, how do we measure the qualitative and quantitative response we're getting from folks? And and how do we kind of carefully and tactically not replicate services that are already delivered in this town? So um, when you hear numbers on the lower end for the first six months, those aren't about, I'm not talking about what Crest's capability will be in year two. I'm saying in year one, um, we are really, really going to need to make sure we make every step deliberative and thoughtful and so that we can build on it. So it isn't about lowering the capacity that the CSWG offered us. It's really saying to get there, we need to be mindful and thoughtful also so we can keep the folks we hire. If we go too fast, too quick, it will be hard for them to maintain this job. So um, I, I just don't want folks thinking we're going, uh, that we're going into this meekly. We're still gonna be brave. We're still gonna be as tough as everyone else, but we're gonna do that in a way that allows us to kind of sustain. And just follow up. I just really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you, Scott, as well. Um, I think it really is important to build the confidence and to also know what the capacity is right now. So um, thank you. That's really helpful. The only thing I could add there, and thanks, Earl, and thanks, Chief. Um, yes, we want a successful launch. Uh, we want Crest having successful outcomes on these original calls. And again, this is, as we get going, this is not including because it's not happening right now. I don't know what percent of calls, I don't know how many calls that Crest will actually be out there self-initiating things. And talking with Earl, he's already been out there stirring the pot sometimes for things in town. So there's going to be calls that we will start um, generating reports on that we're not doing right now because we um, haven't really launched. So that could be could be 50 calls a week for all we know. Um, so that will come back to our staffing and see how it will impact our staffing our ability to stay on top of these things. Um, the 10% is basically, um, it's based on the type of calls as the chief said that we've been looking at now, this would be a good call for Crest to go to, or Crest could go as a parallel response to this type of call. Um, some medical mental things, um, some homelessness issues, some trespass issues, some just regular suspicious calls about somebody who looks like they may need to be talked to on the street, some parental things where somebody wants some parenting done or some assistance with, uh, with a youth that uh, we don't have anybody to send to right now. So it's those type of calls. And the program will certainly grow from here. And I'm, I'm sure those numbers will um, reflect that growth. Uh, as far as the staffing for, for Crest, um, I don't know if the current staffing, was that the question about the current staffing for Crest? Will it be sufficient? 
Yeah, I was asking, I think Earl sort of answered that and saying that he's um, a department of one right now, but I was wondering if the proposed amount of responders will meet that, that 10% need, if that's, or if it's sort of going to be moving together as you see. Yeah, what the like, is. Okay. And I'm sorry, I, I wrote something, but I don't know what your, the third question was. Um, I think it was, I think you, you covered everything, Mike. I think okay. it is all covered. Thank you. Welcome. Good. Thank you. Then I'll uh, call and see Kathy. You had your hand um, up. Andy, why don't you let Alicia go first? Because I, I spoke earlier. Okay. I can then wait. I will vary from the order of hands raised to Alicia. Um, thank you, Kathy. Um, I have a couple of things that I am wondering. Um, first, and I'm just going to read them all. Um, first is that I'm wondering why we're going with parallel response when CSWG specifically advised against that and said that we don't believe that that will be the right, the right um, format for the town of Amherst. Um, and then we also talked about that press will be responding to 10% of, of calls. Um, and there was something mentioned about 90% of noise complaints come from UMass students. So I'm wondering if CRESS will be responding to noise complaints at all or what the idea is with that. Um, and then I also just wanted to set, like just set a reminder for everyone because I feel like this is continuously lost in translation that the CSWG was created to create an alternative public safety service with the intention of serving the BIPOC community who has troubles and there are existing trust issues between some people in the community and the APD. And this was the goal to help create an anti-racist environment in the town of Amherst. This is not just to address homelessness. This is not just to address mental health issues. And a lot of people live, I, their identities exist somewhere in between all of these things. And so I think that I'm kind of worried about that. And my, my last question is that, um, we're talking about staffing levels and the ability for Crest to respond. And is that because of there aren't enough responders, there isn't enough funding? Or what is the reason Crest can't respond to the calls that were intended by the CSWG and that were recommended? Chief, I don't, mind if, I don't know if you mind if I take first, because I think some of these are probably more mine. Um, so yes, I just ahead, kind of want to work backwards, if you don't mind. Um, so I, I've, I've heard this from folks, the idea that, you know, Crest being anti-racist and biased, kind of who we work with um, and where we spend our time. So I've met with a lot of the homeless folks in this town, and they, they are people of color. They're also poor people. They're also victims of sexual exploitation and abuse. They are folks who have not been connected to systems. And so um, it has felt important to, as much as possible, be a lifeline. We're also doing events in the, the apartment complexes. Um, I'm involved in several mediations between uh, BIPOC tenants and their white neighbors in apartment complexes across the town. Uh, we, we intend to do everything we can to kind of meet the goals of the CSWG and the LEAP report and everything we do. Um, the, the lower numbers on the responses at the beginning are not about the overall capacity. It's about that we won't be able to hire anybody who's been a CREST responder before. Uh, we won't have anybody who comes in with, with a ton of experience. So it's, it's less about kind of what we'll look like as a fully formed group and more about how do we make sure that you know, we're doing the right thing and we're doing it in a deliberative way. Uh, parallel responses are actually, I thought, uh, I felt like a response to pieces of the CSWG report, the pieces about how could we be involved in situations like domestic violence, where um, there is a crime and there is a victim. And um, we're still really game planning that out. But really, our goal is um, that when there are uh, situations that could involve more than one sort of response that maybe there's someone who could use some community support maybe there uh someone who could be in need of that that would be helpful but also that you know we i recognize that redemption sits at the core of crest's responsibilities and that even perpetrators have a right to 
compassion and care. And so meeting folks at those instances in which police may be the main person, uh, we still intend to support them at the county jail while they're there and when they come home. Um, our kind of overarching goal has been to serve every Amherst resident wherever they may be to the best of our ability. So um, I just want to acknowledge too, this is this is a tricky process and we're not going to be perfect. So we're, we're always you know hearing and learning from folks. Sorry, Chief. Thanks, Earl. Um, and I think he covered the parallel response question and uh, the 10% calls is specific to a leash, the noise complaints. Um, there might be times where they can respond, uh, respond to a noise complaint. The issue were, and we started to look into that, okay, what calls might they be able to respond to, um, you know, neighbor dispute, just having conflicts there or, you know, the barking dog complaint, that sort of thing. Um, what we don't, what they won't have the ability to do is take any sort of punitive action that includes, you know, writing TBL violations and or testifying in court. So if they respond to a noise complaint of a hundred people and they get no cooperation, then what happens? Or, you know, I, we don't want to put our crest responders in a situation where they don't want to be crest responders anymore. Because, you know, I think, and Earl has brought a lot of light to this. There's not a lot of people looking to get into the social services field. And, you know, the recruitment part of it's going to be important for us to make sure that we get people who want to be here for the right reasons and are sustainable. So, you know, I think we are looking at the potential for them to respond to some noise complaints. And there's going to be a lot of noise complaints that they can't respond to. So for that reason, we're going to have to have potentially some sort of parallel response, at least in the beginning, um, specific to noise complaints and probably other calls as well. And, and as Earl pointed out and Mike, I think what we're gonna see in year one of the Crest program is gonna be you know, different from what we see in year two. So um, you know, it's gonna be a lot of, hey, did this work? Did this not work? What worked? And what can we expand the call volume to? So uh, I don't, we just don't have all the answers yet, so. Okay. Alicia, I was trying to come back to the person who asked the question uh, to see if there's follow-up. So please, if you have something. Yeah, just two additional things. Thank you, Andy. Um, the reason why I asked that, because I know we did talk about some of those things in the implementation team meeting, but we also talked about possibilities of having Crest respond and maybe having the PD like somewhere in the wing so that if they are needed, they can be called and they can't be far, but that we don't need to always have a parallel response because again, the purpose of the Crest was for an alternative program to exist. And to me, this is sounding a lot like just an extension of the PD. And so I also want to know like what specifically is the Crest program doing to differentiate itself from the PD to create an anti-racist culture? What, what types of training and degrees that are different from the PD? Like what is distinguishing this as an alternative and not just different, like moving things over to different people? That's a great question. I would say the folks who are applying for these positions are a huge differentiator. Uh, we have folks who are coming from the educational system, the human services field, um, the training we're offering our conflict resolution uh, by the CRG group out of Springfield that does restorative justice between uh, inmates at the Hampton County Jail and their, their victims. Um, NVC, uh, nonviolent communication, we're receiving that training from two uh, residents of the town of Amherst. Uh, our homeless uh, outreach framework is coming from Jay Levy, an internationally uh, kind of recognized frame for uh, engaging with folks who are treatment resistant, which is uh, likely how folks end up chronically homeless. Uh, we're receiving um, training from as many lived experience groups, including the Wildflower Alliance. Um, and we are kind of continuing to pursue those. Um, I think what ultimately is gonna make us look different is our actions. And it's hard for me to, to exactly quantify how our actions are gonna be different. Um, we won't have weapons, which that's meaningful. Um, and I think to Scott's point, we don't have a stick. Um, we're an engagement strategy, right? We're, we're with you, we're working with you, we're um, doing our best to convince 
to support someone to change their own lives because that's ultimately how this works. Um, so uh, some of this is, uh, is hypothetical and it's hard to answer hypotheticals for a program that doesn't have a real, there's nothing quite like Crest in the country. Um, not one that is so tied into municipal government. So um, I guess uh, coming from the state, that is my unsatisfying answer for the day uh, and a commitment to find you a better satisfying answer in the months to come. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Yep. Can I just add um, the term parallel response? That's actually something that Earl brought up. And we're going to try to differentiate this from a call response. So touching on Alicia's question, we do foresee calls where we will be telling the officer, um, you know, we'll be telling the officer that Crest is responding to such and such a location for a well-being check. And that'll be the key, knowing that in this call, Crest is primary and the police officer is backup, and vice versa. There will be calls. We'll be telling press that we have PD responding to such and such a location for a well-being check. That'll be the key to the Crest team to know that the police are going to be primary here till it's investigated. The police may get there and say, "Oh, this is good. Crest can handle this," and and they'll be gone. So we did look at that. We're just trying to again trying to have this program be successful. We don't want to send Crest responders someplace on their own that we in dispatch said, oh, we don't know this person, doesn't sound like it's gonna be a problem. Crest responder gets there and bottles start getting thrown. And now the police response may be five minutes away. Um, so we're trying to desperately avoid that type of liability. And the police response would need to be more aggressive in that situation. So we would have, if something like that were to happen, we would have, you know, unintentionally harm the ability for de-escalation by the police. So it's also kind of looking at the potential ramifications. We, you know, we don't want to be so eager that we make life harder for our, our, for our community. Sean, did I just wanted to call out that we're about 20 minutes past um, the time we had allocated for um, police communications and animal welfare. Um, and it seems like we're sort of, stepping out of the budget conversation and more into operational stuff. And I just, and, and Crest is coming up too. That's a, that they're gonna have their own, their own time and a few, uh, one more department. Um, so I just wanna call out that we're, we're straying into where we might have to reschedule some departments if we don't get back on track. Good, thank you. But I'll pull Kathy. Uh, um, actually, I wanted to echo what Sean just said, because I think, um, I have a lot of thoughts and in terms of my other life before the council in the healthcare world, watching new workforces be developed and evolved. And I just think we could shift this to a terrific different conversation out of the budget side. Um, and um, it, you know, there, there's a lot of evidence that you have to move not just move slowly, but uh, build experience to know what you can do. And I think there's some good models out there and people who have learned from them. And I'm not saying in the Crest world, but in the healthcare world, when they brought in huge, newly trained, differently trained people and, and what they did. So I would just like to recommend that we move this and create a space to have the discussion um, because the expectations we need to do this well, and it's an incredibly exciting program. And it right now, it's not a budget issue. So I'm recommending, Andy, that we not in even finance, Lynn, if we can just find a space that anyone who wants to come and have this kind of discussion. It's more of a working group discussion on evolution of human service programs um, and data systems, too, Lynn, I think are critical. And I think we can learn from some people that don't try to buy an off-the-shelf $300,000 one that may do what we want or may not, but really be thoughtful about it. So that was my going to be my plea. Yeah, I th thank you all for uh, both of you for getting us back to reminding ourselves that this is budget, that we can't solve all of the operational questions within the budget meeting and address budget. Uh, we may need to ask Paul at some point to uh, create some kind of um, program and maybe after there's a little bit more experience and we have a little we're closer to actually being operational with responders 
Um, I had a question. I mean, I don't want an answer to it um, because it's just another example, which is experiences that we have from working with the University of Massachusetts and some of its programs working with students that are student run through the off campus housing office and whether that um, gives us any instruction. But I, I think that that's the kind of operational question that I don't want to take time with today. Bob? Yeah, I do want to just raise a financial issue and that is um, with, with the, um, with Crest, you know, becoming operational, we may find that there are a lot of hidden costs or things that we, we can't anticipate now. So I would just like to suggest that, uh, you know, Chief Livingstone, Mr. Miller, um, Mr. Bachelman, just track where we are as we go into FY23 and make sure we don't kind of find ourselves in a, in a hole somewhere down the, down the pike. I mean, it would be helpful to have, uh, you know, updates or to know that we're, we're on tar target or we're spending too much or whatever. That's all. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Alicia. Um, thank you. Uh, so I, I am in support of like shifting the conversation, but I do want to state, however, that I appreciate the answers to my questions because um, the way that the programs operate directly affects the budget. And so my questions I need to understand how the budget is set up, how money is allocated and how all of this is working together and how it's going to be funded. And if like these questions were all directly related to the budget. So I just want to say that because I think it was really important for me and my understanding to have these questions answered right now. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Chief, you just, uh, we haven't really talked about the police department budget. Yeah, we can do it another day, Andy. Um, I mean, we, we should probably finish police and then um, yeah. follow, follow the schedule we have. Um, and if we get to, you know, by 11 o'clock, we're not on to community <laughs> services, we may want to um, invite um, some people back. We have a we have a meeting at the end that we can use that we didn't we didn't fill up the agenda yet. So. So do you want to move forward, Sean? Or Andy? Yes, yeah, so I'd say please and okay because i think we need to talk about staffing uh in the police department and uh i know this is a logical time to do that so yeah the first item actually on on the public safety or the police line item budget or budget excuse me was the police facility i don't think jeremiah is here and although i know a lot about this building um, yeah, don't don't do facility. Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah, we'll do that at the end with the other facilities. Sounds good. So I'll jump right in and try and go as quickly as I can. And I know, Kathy, you presented a bunch of uh, uh, seven or eight questions, and I want to make sure I get to those as well. You know, I'll try and go quickly, and then if there are questions, um, we can jump on board. But uh, I think everybody's aware that uh, so we are budgeted at forty six police officers and two support staff in the budget. That's down two positions from last year. And I know there's a question directly specific to that and how it's impacted us. Uh, I'll try and go quickly to our recent accomplishments unless you just want me to jump right into the financial part of it, Sean or Andy. The, the recent accomplishments and key challenges haven't changed a lot over the years. So I could you know, jump through those if you prefer. Yeah, um, and as you do, I, you know, focus on what are the new challenges that you've seen within the last year in particular. You know, and again, going through, coming out of the COVID year, we anticipated that, you know, call volume and calls, um, we're going to get back to, you know, what we call normal, and that's it, pretty much exactly what's happening. Um, you know, it was a relatively quiet year when it came to quality of life issues in, in the COVID time frame for, for obvious reasons with the students not being in town on one year and then very restricted 
for, for the half of another year. So uh, the call volumes are returning to normal as we anticipated. And um, we, we have dealt with those uh, as we always have. Um, you know, calls for services. So, so going back to 2017, we're in the 17,000 range and they're now this past year back up to 16,000 and some change in the categories I know you all have on page 121. Um, you know, those statistics are getting back again to pre-COVID norms. And, and again, this was all anticipated and expected and we deal with it on a regular basis. Um, you know, I'll, I'll jump right into to Kathy's questions if, if people want, and that way we can come back with questions that are sp more specific to um, the town police budget. Um, well, I'll read the questions and then I'll give you the answers as best that I can. Um, question one was how many of the 16,000 plus calls listed on page 121 are officers responding in neighborhoods or officers um, related to a UMass off campus? Now that's a difficult answer or question to answer, Kathy. We don't track um, the individuals when we respond to those types of calls. In other words, we don't, we can guess that they're probably UMass students, but it's not something that we actually track. So uh, I think Mike pointed out, you know, it's a general guess that most of our noise complaints are related to UMass students, uh, although we can't quantify that with data. So, you know, we get there and there's a whole bunch of 18 and 19 year olds, you know, it's pretty obvious who's responsible for those types of parties, but to put a specific number or percentage on that, you know, we don't have the ability to track that. Um, question two was of the traffic stops for DUI and speeding and other significant motor violations, what are the percent related to students? And perhaps the, using the numbers between the summer months and the, and the um, school months uh, would help with that. You know, um, I can tell you that surprisingly, the majority of our OUI arrests are not UMass students. Uh, I was surprised to hear that when we, we did the analysis because that's something we can track. When somebody is arrested, we do ask, you know, as part of, you know, their job or what they do as a profession and they answer UMass student, we can track that. So, um, you know, the arrest numbers are up for both alcohol and drug related OUIs. Um, but the larger percentage of them um, are not are not students. So um, only twenty percent of percent of those are UMass students, and the rest are other individuals. So that, that gives you an idea of where we are with the um, the OUI question and um, significant motor violation charges, like endangering and that sort of thing. And Gabe, if there's something I'm missing, don't be afraid to jump in. Uh, question three was uh, table shows a decline in nuisance house violations in FY21 compared to pre-COVID. What has been the experience this year and it's specific to revenues and repeat um, houses? So again, um, you know, we can, we can make an assumption that the majority of the nuisance house violations that we issue are to students, um, but that isn't something that we would track necessarily. Um, as far as the fines, they are consistent at $300. And those go to, those fines go to every individual in the home. So if there are four people on the lease who are responsible for, for hosting a large party that becomes a nuisance, and the officer makes uh, the decision to issue TBL violations, each individual uh, person on the lease gets a $300 fine. So if it's four people, it's a $1,200 fine. Um, typically those get appealed to the court what we don't have any control over is the decision made by either the judge or the clerk magistrate. So if there's a $1,200 fine, in most cases, those are reduced to $300, which I don't like it. Um, I've spoken to judges about it, but it's their mechanism to try and hold these people responsible in a different mechanism, uh, a restorative justice type of, of thing. I can tell you that of the nuisance house violations that we do have when we do write citations for, rarely do we get a repeat offender. So um, we are not going back to the same location and having to issue 
nuisance house violations to those locations. Um, so that, that, you know, that's a positive that comes out of that. Uh, question four, uh, is there an estimate of how many calls for service might be handled by Cress or a team with Cress? Um, I think we kind of addressed that um, and I'll move on and maybe Earl can jump on that one when, when his budget uh, comes up. But um, again, you know, we're working on, on that and um, that's going to be subject to change, I think over the course of six months a year. So um, Earl, I'll dump that one off on you when your turn comes up. Um, question five was mental health, medical assist, we're up substantially in FY21. What has the FY22 experience been? Um, please discuss and how we respond to that. If it's a joint EMS or medical assist and where are the locations that pre people bring um, other than the ER um, and it's Cooley Dickinson a resource for the mental health outpatient stabilization. Um, the first part of that medical mental calls are up, they're up substantially and that trend is continuing. Um, you know, the majority of the calls that we get sent to usually have an EMS response to it. Individual is known to us and a lot of these people are known to us. So you'll get both police and fire responding to medical mental or medical assist type calls. Um, our only avenue right now, our only resource is Cooley Dickinson Hospital to, to um, have those people transported and quite frankly, Cooley Dickinson isn't set up to handle these types of calls. Um, they're just not. Um, and it's, there's no other area that we can bring and a lot of that falls on EMS when they're making the decision on where they're gonna transport somebody. You know, if somebody's attempted to harm themselves, they may end up going to Bay State or Holyoke Hospital, but the majority of those transport go to Cooley Dick. And I'll give you an example when we've had to section 12 somebody and what that is is a mechanism for us to take care of somebody who's not capable of taking care of themselves and or have caused harm to themselves. And that's kind of a last resort for police officers, but we do have the authority to do that. But it is not uncommon for us to section 12 somebody and have to section 12 that person 24 hours later. So the individual goes to Cooley Dick, gets an evaluation and they're back out on the street in 12 hours. So that's frustrating for both EMS, for Tim's people and for us as well. Um, so that's an area that needs to be fixed. And it's at a much higher level uh, than either myself, Tim or, or Earl. So, you know, that's a discussion we probably need to have at a regional level. Um, question six was um, page 119 indicates COVID challenges for staffing and please discuss the time commitment. You anticipate police time and COVID receding. Um, so we had a lot of different protocols that were put into place to minimize contact wherever possible when it went during the really high COVID time. And that included things like noise disturbances. So if police officers were sent to a noise complaint and there were two or 300 people there, the officers had to be extreme. You know, they were even when they were masked up and everything needed to be very careful about how they handled those situations. So we had to change protocols about how they dealt with, with the individuals, including not going into homes and that sort of thing to deal with certain calls. So, you know, that was a major change on how, how we did policing um, for, for a lot of different types of calls. Um, you know, we had a lot of officers who over the course of the time, con you know, contracted COVID themselves. So, you know, they're out for extended periods of time and then Officers needed to be hired on overtime to, you know, fill those voids. So it was a, it was a pretty stressful time, um, for, like for every department, right? All the departments that had to deal with it, but in particular for our officers, because uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but you know, a dozen maybe or more officers contracted COVID some multiple times, and you know, it was stressful for them. It was stressful for their families, and, and so that was it, it was a tough, and it's. It's good that we're coming out of that. Um, question seven is the department is operating with two fewer officers in FY21 and please discuss how this resulted more overtime turnover or staff concerns. 
and um, what is anticipated as crest expands with staffing. Um, so yeah, I could probably go on for several hours about that question. Um, directly responsible for the two officers that we lost last year to the defund. Um, we had an officer that was assigned um, as a neighborhood liaison officer specifically to downtown Amity Street, Lower Main Street. So that it was kind of a knockoff of Bill Laramie's position because Bill was being overwhelmed with a lot of his work. So we were looking to build on um, the neighborhood liaison positions. And so we, just, we basically just started that and then we had to eliminate it. So the officer that was assigned to Central downtown, Lower Main Street, Amity, Lincoln, uh, that position was eliminated. And we had an officer who was assigned directly to the district attorney's office to handle a regional um, crime task force, that position was eliminated. So that officer was responsible for doing a lot of investigations that were more regional in approach. Um, you know, we had some houses that were drug houses. We had some um, regional um, sexual, um, uh, sexual cases and assault cases that were at a regional level. We also had a number of uh, break-ins and uh, I think you probably all read about you know, thefts from vehicles and catalytic converter, th catalytic converter type um, investigations. So that officer would work regionally with all the other police officers that were assigned from other agencies. Um, and so that position was eliminated. So those two positions were, were eliminated and taken on by the officers uh, left in both the detective bureau and, and patrol. You know, I, I know we had addressed this a long time ago um, when we did a budget uh, overview, but you know, we only have three police officers on any shift at any time who are actually out on patrol. That, you know, I, I I know that surprised a lot of people. I think a lot of people thought there were like six or seven police officers out on patrol, and so for each shift, there's only three officers. One's assigned to North Amherst, one's assigned to the center of town, and one's assigned to South Amherst. So that is our regular shift. So when somebody takes a vacation day or calls out sick, that officer has to be replaced on overtime. And a lot of times that overtime is mandated. Um, so officer coming off the midnight to eight shift finds out at six o'clock in the morning that somebody called out sick, you know, or has a family member or a kid that's sick and they can't come in. A lot of times that midnight to eight officer has to stay and work, you know, the entire eight hour shift. So a lot of our overtime is forced overtime and, um, now that that's just that's just the norm. So, um, so yeah. And the last question, it looks like UMass has shifted its graduation date next year to the uh, Memorial Day weekend. Will the police need extra support as a result? Can we quantify the cost and staffing, and do police UMass police help? And what is the plan? So. Yeah, there's a, yeah, I'm probably not the most popular person up at the University of Mass Administration right now. Um, when I found out about this, I got on the phone immediately with some people that I'm close to up there. And I, maybe we're still friends, I don't know. Uh, but I'm not happy about that decision, quite frankly. And I, I can't sugarcoat it. You know, back in 2008 and 2009, when they made the transition to the earlier graduation time, it was a relief to my police staff and police officers. The month of May was always extremely dis, um, stressful. Uh, the, the weather's beautiful. Students are really getting excited about graduation. Large day drinks were the norm. Uh, we eliminated all of that um, through a lot of the community outreach that we did. And quite frankly, just from not having a whole bunch of students in town in May, you know, everyone's familiar with the Hobart hoedown if you're not. Google it, um, it's, it's quite telling and I'm nervous about things going back to the old days. And um, you know, the other thing, you, UMass being able to help out, usually when we're busy, they're busy. So um, it's easy to help each other out when there's a planned event like a, you know, a Patriots Super Bowl party or the Red Sox game seven, those are easy. Um, you know, the Blarney blowout, we bring in additional officers what I don't want to see trying us have to do is bring in mutual aid partners for the entire month of May 
trying to deal with what we anticipate are going to become more frequent um, large scale party events with alcohol and, and types of those events because we've done a really good job of eliminating that through a lot of hard work over the years. And, you know, Bill Laramie was instrumental in that as were all the sector officers. So, you know, I know we're going to be anticipating additional meetings with the university. I've stressed to them, my, uh, I'm not happy with the fact that they're changing the graduation date, you know, and a perfect example is we, this past graduation, this past weekend, we had 13 posts that we were trying to fill for trap just for one day for traffic for graduation, and we were only able to fill five of them. So, you know, it's little things like that where by the end of the year, by the end of this uh, year, officers have, are ready to take some breaks. And June, July, and August are when they're allowed to take those breaks. We restrict time off. We don't allow officers to use vacation time on Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays in the months of September, October, uh, March, end of March, April, and May. So, you know, that's kind of a big deal when, you know, you have your boss telling you you can't take time off to go to a relative's um, wedding or something of that nature. So, you know, um, I, I'll get off my soapbox now and, and just ask if there are any additional questions um, that I can answer. Thank you. Kathy, did you have anything else or shall um, I get? You, you know, the uh, one, and this can be, um, maybe we can try to quantify it at another time. One of my trying to link the level of service that mm -hmm. you're providing to the fact that it's UMass, um, I feel they are not contributing adequately to the Amherst Town Services budget. So I think the more we can quantify some of these in terms of time. So it wasn't meant so, so your answers were great, but I, Andy, that's why I put some of those down, you know, that um, the, the fact that our, our, our police are often called out for, uh, and, and, and the contrast with summer months. So I, I don't want to pursue that, but that's what, where I was going with some of these questions is trying to get um, Paul and Sean on a number, you know, like X percent of our police budget is related to the fact that there's a University of Massachusetts and we can document in the following way, or you'll see I've done the same thing with EMS and fire. So it's just trying to make a link to the fact that we are providing services but not getting paid for them because they don't pay taxes to us so i'll just stop that's that's thank you very much and uh, uh, for your answers well, thank you. I, would just, I would just also add cat i mean i kind of skirted over a lot of stuff i try to go through things relatively quickly we have attempted to do in the past mutual type patrols with the university uh it hasn't worked out real well there are some issues with the uh, university police patrolman's union so some issues with jurisdictional issues. Uh, you know, the UMass police don't have the authority to do certain things, including some arrest and that type. Of, they don't have the ability to write TBL viol violations and that sort of thing. So, you know, if we could get them to respond, they would have to respond mutually with an Amherst police officer. Okay. So we have about five hands up, and I want to um, allow a uh, question or two from each of them. And uh, then we need, we do need to move on. So, because we need to get on, we have Crescent Fire and uh, Shauna looking like we may not get beyond public safety today. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think um, maybe we should just um, let the senior center and, um, and the public health department and veterans go and I'll reschedule them for the, the last meeting in uh, May. And my thank you to Haley and Jennifer for being here. And I, my apology for not being able to uh, run it as quickly. It just is a lot of interest and important questions that came up. Um, so going back to counselors uh, and committee members, Matt. Hey, thanks, Andy, and thanks so much, Chief. And to everybody for the time and work that's gone into this. And, uh, you know, I just wanna echo what others have said about the excitement around this CREST program. 
the excitement about the Kennedy Center partnership. I hope that's a, a place where we can get some good data analysis and thought, thought partnership on this, um, to Lynn's point. And uh, I actually have a very specific question for the chief that I didn't give in, in advance. So if you just want to sort of say, I'll get back to you, that's okay too. Um, I'm just wondering, and this does tie into um, obviously questions about Cress as well. I'm just wondering of the, you know, 16,000 or so calls for service, um, how much of that is dedicated to the, to the pre-K to 12 schools? Um, I know that's a very loaded and, and, you know, very complex issue on a programmatic side, but I was just kind of looking at it from, from the numbers. If you, can, if you can ballpark that for us, that's great. If you want to just get back to me, that's fine too. Thank you. I could probably get you some pretty specific numbers on response to schools, Matt. Uh, it would probably just take a matter of a day. Uh, I'm guessing, and I can tell you from experience, they're probably not very high. Um, you know, we, we don't have a school resource officer in the times that we are requested at the school. It's, it's for, you know, minor types of things and that sort of thing. But I could get you some definitive numbers on that, but probably not a lot of calls. Okay, well, thank you. If you do have anything, uh, you can send it to Sean or through me and uh, we'll get it to the committee, but thank you. Uh, Pam? Thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody. The staff time is um, greatly appreciated here. Um, it's a question about overtime and I don't, I would be interested to know, there's been a lot of discussion about overtime what is sort of the ratio of the, the hours of overtime that are paid out at presumably a higher uh, rate and the cost of a position with benefits? Where, where, do, where do we sort of average out on that? Uh, I'm not up to speed, Sean, on the benefit part of it. Um... So the question is, Rough, I mean, so benefits, it depends if an individual selects a family plan, a single plan, an HMO, a PPO. So, um, you know, so it varies widely. I'd say sort of the maximum is probably in the, uh, in terms of the town's share of the cost is somewhere in the eighteen, nineteen thousand $19,000 range, maybe a little bit more now. Um, but that would be for the town share. Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong, if you've got more specific numbers in front of you. And I, that would be just for health insurance. Um, with, pen, so, so, with pension costs, it's it's part of a bigger formula. We belong to a group, so it's not sort of a one-to-one -one with pension costs. And I shouldn't have been quite that that general, but but if we if we took a if we took a let's say just a starting um, officer officer benefits, you know how how does that how does that compare to? Um, you know, what you pay out in terms of overtime and where, where does that, I'm, I'm not expressing this well. Yeah, I, no, I kind of get where you're going, Pam. Um, you know, we've been funded oh, back in 2007 or eight. I think we are funded at 51 police officers and we are all now, now, now funded at 46. I can tell you the overtime budget hasn't been affected drastically by changing two or three positions, either up or down. Uh, again, um, you know, we're at kind of a minimum of officers on the street. So typically, as I mentioned, three officers are out there at a time. And when somebody is, if a detective calls in sick, we don't have to replace that, right? Or if I call in sick one day, we don't replace that. I'm talking almost exclusively on patrol officers. So when the patrol, patrol officers call out sick, those are the ones that need to be replaced on overtime. And we, usually always exhaust our overtime budget and it's $290,000, I believe. So, you know, it, it would, would it be easy to say if we had an, another two officers, would the overtime budget come down to the uh, amount that those officers cost? It doesn't really work like that, um, you know, unfortunately. So um, I hope that kind of, I mean, our starting salary is $46,000 and it goes uh, through 10 steps to 65,000. And of course, overtime is paid at one and a half times the officer's hourly rate. So, you know, if it's a lot of young officers working overtime, we can get a lot more out of them than some of the older officers, but, and that's typically how it works. Thank you. Yep. Jennifer. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. This is a more probably a request 
Uh, then a comment about the budget, although it might, it does pertain to what Kathy mentioned of how much of a police department um, calls is related to having UMass <clears throat> in our town. But um, the comment was made that, I guess I would ask um, if when the police respond to noise and nuisance or any, uh, it could be van, you know, any other calls to a student house, it's pretty clear it's an absentee owned student house or it's a student house, whether the owner lives there or not, presumably it's, I mean, it, it's probably absentee. What, why couldn't that just be recorded that the call went to a student house? And I was very interested because it's confirmed what many of us who've been following this for years have noted that 95% of noise and nuisance calls tend to be related to students because on the council, we are getting an increasing number of emails from throughout the town where more and more homes on what have traditionally been, you know, streets where non-student households have lived, that there are more and more absentee owned student houses and there are noise and nuisance and other concerns related to that. And um, I think there's been a response on the part of people that this may not be part of their daily lives, that this is an exaggeration, that it's not so much happening. And it would be really helpful as we're trying to document this, if the there could be some just notation when police respond to calls uh, that it's a student house. And it was encouraging to hear that when uh, the Amherst Police Department's experience has been with that when they um, respond to a house once and they um, give a noise and nuisance violation that they're not called back. Although I know in um, one of the neighborhoods I represent like 20 Allen Street 35 Phillips, 164, 174 Sunset, and I may be wrong, 342 Lincoln, that there, you know, there definitely are houses where the repeated calls. And then of course, there's the issue of every year when the occupancy changes, then there's calls to the same house, even if it's different people living there. So I guess I would just, on behalf of many neighborhoods and an increasing number of neighborhoods in town, ask if there could be a way to um, be able to keep data on when um, calls to from the police department are to absentee owned student houses. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and I, I would agree with you, Jennifer. Um, we're finding, we're certainly finding more and more homes are, are being purchased in non-traditional student housing areas, correct? So somebody buys a house and they rent it out to four students and we're, we end up responding there a lot. And the turnover is an issue as well because you're getting new people in there the next year and so, you know, we're, we're continually responding to the same location a lot of times because certain houses get reputations and, hey, this is a great place to live if you like to party, right? And so, you know, we are cognizant of that. And Bill Laramie does try and track certain houses for sure. Um, but the, yeah, there might be a mechanism where we can just say, yeah, no question, student housing and keep tabs on that. And I can speak with Gabe and Ron about doing that, that tracking type thing. Yeah, thank you. And even if you're not keeping tabs, that might be a lot of work, just so there's a record of how many calls are to student houses. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. Um, I once asked a, a police chief I was working with what if he could have any kind of in, in, innovation in the, in the system, any kind of technology, what would he like? What would he prefer? And he said he wanted a DA who could go from arrest to conviction in 45 minutes. Um, so that question is about court time, Chief, and, and how much it impacts us and, and how uh, relationships have been going with the, uh, with the court system in terms of managing uh, officers' time in court. Sure. So court time, um, mostly because of COVID, so there are a lot fewer arrests and a lot fewer interactions. So, you know, take COVID years out of it. But, um, and we're also part of the restorative justice program uh, through the DA's office. So what that does is eliminate the need for officers to go to test and then testify. So officers aren't testifying in court as frequently as they did. Well, like when I was a young police officer, I was seemed like I was in court every day. So, um, and there's a lot more um, desire by the district attorney's office not to have things go to trial. Uh, it's just, it's, um, they're backlogged. Um, the police departments are backlogged, so the, the more serious crimes are getting the priority. So um, fewer and fewer people 
course, are taking uh, issues to court, uh, criminal court, I'm speaking of, and um, our court uh, hours are down substantially, yes. Thank you. Bob. Bob. Thanks, Andy. Um, Chief, uh, we all know that um, um, radicalization and hate crimes are up all over the country, and we just saw an example of that in Buffalo a couple of days ago. Um, are, 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 are you tracking that or monitoring that uh, in Amherst? And uh, is the budget any hindrance to your ability to do that? So we do track that and we are mandated by law to track that. And Ronnie, are you still on? Um, I'm here, Chief. Okay, maybe you can speak to the, to the, the uh, tracking of uh, hate crimes and that sort of thing, whether we've seen enough increase or decrease in that? Actually, we, uh, ironically, the, the numbers have stayed pretty much the same over the last decade or so. We're required, as, as you pointed out, Chief, correctly, that we're required to report those on an annual basis to the state. Um, and the state actually keeps those on file and then compares them to the, to the statewide averages. The AG's office uses that data and they help facilitate training as uh, law enforcement techniques, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, we do track those. Um, fortunately, we, we are on the lower end of, of the state numbers, um, particularly the Eastern part of the state. There were some shocking and surprising numbers this past year. That um, was impacted like many things by COVID a lot because a lot of our calls for service and a lot of uh, response to service were diminished over the last two years. But yeah, the short answer is yes, we do track that data and it is readily available. Typically, Bob, those calls would go directly when we do get those types of uh, calls for investigation, they go directly to the detective bureau who handles those. So it wouldn't be a patrol function. Okay, well, thanks. <clears throat> Okay, um, Mandy, and then uh, maybe we can move on from police, but. Uh... Thank you, Andy. Um, just two questions. I know Kathy asked about the increase in med mental med assist calls. It looks like it's been really high up. Are those something that Crest will be able to handle um, in the future? Um, you know, is, is that a a result of a change in protocol um, or you know just can you expound on that a little bit more as to wh what is going on in when uh, APD responds to those types of calls and then the other one is a staffing question um, I looked at the charts and you know you have on the um, I, I don't know which side it is you have a captain a lieutenant um, and a sergeant uh, supervising six detectives it looks like um, and it looks like there are nine supervisors in the LTs and sergeants supervising 26 patrol officers, which uh, in my estimate was an average of one and a half supervisors for every four patrol officers, or essentially one for every three patrol officers and one for every two to three detectives. Uh, that seems like a whole lot um, that mm -hmm. might not be necessary, um, especially when we look at our fire department, which has one supervisor for every four to five um, firefighters, EMTs. So can you explain um, why we have so many supervisors? And then uh, a similar question, which is, you talked about the overtime needed for patrol officers um, when one calls out because there's only three on. Are our LTs and sergeants on the operation on that side um, taking over those shifts um, since they are presumably on shift at that time um, instead of calling in overtime? Are they going back out on patrol to avoid overtime? Sure, so every shift has at least one sergeant on um, that oversees the patrol officers. The four to 12 has two supervisors on, so one um, sergeant and one lieutenant, and that's the same with the midnight to eight. Um, the, the biggest reason is um, one of the largest litigation issues in policing and police work is failure to supervise. So, um, we have found in our agency, um, the, well, you know, it's basically nine supervisors in the patrol and uh, that oversee the patrol officers. That includes a sergeant and a lieutenant. And one sergeant is also working 7P to 3 AM, which is on the desk that oversees prisoners brought in, answers questions of the public, oversees the phone lines, that sort of thing. So that's another uh, supervisor is assigned there. 
In the Detective Bureau, you have a lieutenant that oversees um, six of the um, detectives. There's a sergeant that also handles uh, detective work. So in essence, that sergeant, uh, for instance, is currently working on child sex exploit sexual exploitation cases. So in essence, you have seven detectives being overseen by uh, a lieutenant. But yes, one sergeant who handles more sensitive cases, I guess, is the best way to put that. Um, when it comes to overtime replacement, so yes, when a sergeant is out sick, he's replaced, he or she is replaced by a sergeant. Um, there are times where if it's not a busy time of year, like take the summer, for instance, if a sergeant takes calls out sick and there's a lieutenant on duty, that lieutenant would just fill in. So we don't, we don't hire somebody if we don't have to. So that lieutenant would be responsible for going out on the road on patrol and filling in where that sergeant has, has either called out sick or maybe used a, um, a, a vacation day, that sort of thing. But cur so like currently a good example is one of our sergeant is out on extended medical leave. Um, he, he broke his leg and he's gonna be out probably for six months. So a lot of that, a lot of that replacement is being taken over by a lieutenant who would be working those hours normally anyway. So not all of that vacancy is being filled on overtime. So, you know, those types of things happen. If there's an extended patrolman who's out, we would have to juggle the um, work assignments and move bodies around to, you know, not use up all of our overtime budget on one individual. Let's say somebody a patrolman is out because they were injured or something of that nature. And we have to move bodies around. Sometimes we have to take detectives out of the detective bureau and put them back in patrol and uniform to fill those vacancies and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of juggling that goes on. Um, I, I hope that answered most of your questions. Is there one I missed? No, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I know we want to get beyond police side, uh, but I want to see if Felicia has a question that she really needs to get out. So Alicia. Yeah, I just had a quick question about like staffing level and availability. And if it were be a help, if it would be a helpful thing to limit things like detail, because I know we have like police officers who work like traffic and mm -hmm. why can't we just have a person direct traffic like we have cross and if that would make a difference or how that ties into how everything runs. Sure, so um, officers are only allowed to work details on their off time. So, you know, if it affects and they're restricted by how many hours they can work in a 24 hour period. So, um, you know, the only time an officer can work a traffic detail is on their time off. Like if it's their day off or that sort of thing. Um, and that's when they you typically would see them working. Construction, construction companies, uh, Eversource, they have the option of hiring civilian flag people if they want. So they don't have to hire a police officer if they don't want to. Uh, the majority of them prefer to have a police officer out there, but it, you know, it, that's not our decision. That's not our call. That's up to the contractor. So uh, if somebody wanted, uh, and if it's a state job, what I did learn was um, because they changed that law um, 10 years or so ago. If it's a state job, it's more expensive to hire a civilian flagger than it is to hire a police officer because they get the union rate, um, which I kind of found surprising, but it's is true. So, um, you know, we do monitor the number of hours people work, how, how many they're allowed to work, um, you know, that sort of thing. I think that's about it. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Scott. And just to clarify, so that doesn't doesn't come out of overtime budget or any budget. That's a completely different thing. Correct. As a matter of fact, the town okay. makes, the town makes money off of that. We charge ten percent to bill those people to do the paperwork and stuff. So we, the town does get a little bit of money out of it. But yeah, it doesn't cost doesn't cost my town, or my department, or my uh, anything other. It comes strictly out of the the contractor, whoever's employing that officer. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, from the thank, uh, thank you, Chief, and uh, both the captains, uh, Ron and Gabe, for um, 
being with us. Uh, of course, you're welcome to stay because we're still in, going to be in public safety. Sean, I assume we're going to fire next. Yep, uh, Chief Nelson's here and um, he will yep. lead us through fire. Okay, and uh, so uh, Chief, uh, turn it over to you and uh, you can introduce people that you have with you. PD is a tough act to follow, 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 but we'll do, we'll do our best, I guess. So, you know, so, uh, and well, there's, there's me, I've, I've got assistant, assistant chief, uh, Strom, Strom, and assistant, assistant, assistant chief Olmstead with, with, with us as well to, to chime, chime in as needed, needed. Uh, I'm probably, probably follow, follow, follow Scott, Scott's lead. And, you know, um, uh, if you want, uh, we talk talk about about challenge 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 challenges, of course. I mean, uh, but you know, just a couple of the uh, uh, com accomplishments that that we that I want to uh, I want to bring up. I mean, we've we've done well come, coming out of COVID, uh, trying trying to get back 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 on track. Uh, we've done we've done done well in in the grant arena. arena. We we keep we keep to do do doing well there to get to get a quick equipment for for our depart department one one thing that i've kept kept up is that we've uh we're we're we, we build we keep build build building up our supply of protective protective equipment you know code uh not not so much uh because we're we're we're, we're that that concerned with uh code covid or or or, or, or and anything like that but just 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 you know the 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 available availability is there and we built build built up our, our supplies to a health, 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 healthy level and that's and that's allowed allowed us for for instance to assist, assist the home whole homeless shelter 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 with, with supplies so that's a, that's a, that's one of those those good good things. And again, we've we've uh, done 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 well with grants in the past past year for uh, to different types type, types of uh, equipment, equipment for our line per, per, per personnel. Um, challenge challenges, uh, as I said, I, I echo Scott, Scotty. Uh, you know, our our call call vol 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 volume is back back up to pre COVID little levels. Uh, we're we're back we're back there, uh, and at the same time, uh, what I like like to say is, if it weren't weren't for bad bad luck, we'd have no no luck at all. We uh, our staff staffing issue is, issue re, 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 remains, but at at the same same time, we've 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 got. Uh, quite quite a few few fo folks out long long term in in injuries, uh, uh, long term ill 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 illness. Uh, we've we, we've had some a uh, couple of re re resignations, you know. Fo fo actually, which is good good for them, bad bad for for us. They 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 went on to bigger and better things, which is which which is great. Great, great, great for them, but it still le le leaves us with 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 holes to fill. So, so here, right now, we're probably we've got about uh, nine 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 slots slots that are that are, are empty right 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 now because of uh, in in injuries and Ill, Ill, illness. So, and then uh, and you know we 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 did did add uh, four four additional positions, but that takes time. To you know, to bring folks on, get get them trained, trained, tra trained, trained up, and and again, we're, we're still still short. Um, as the whole world is experiencing, we're 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 having supply supply chain ish, issues. Uh, in ter terms of get, get, keep keep keeping our uh, equipment uh, in 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 top top shape, it takes time. Yeah, it takes takes time 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 to get get the uh, supplies in uh, from for us and for for our vendors, um, and then and of course the cost has gone 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 gone, gone up as well as everyone has seen. I mean, it includes uh, fuel fuel prices that 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 that's affecting us as well. So. You know, those are, those are some of the some, some of the challenges that that we've had, and we I'm, I'm sure sure there's going to be questions, and we, we can kind of dig dig deep deep deeper. But um, 
Uh, we're we're open open open, open to questions. Hey, uh, Kathy, uh, did you have anything to start? You're muted. As, uh, I know. I I'm trying to unmute. I have a window open. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chief. I I sent a few questions in in advance, but I know not um a lot in advance. But I just want to pick up on one thing you just said, and then I'll ask my other questions. Um, on the nine out nine slots empty to injure injury and illness, is the injury rate? higher than you saw three or four years ago how much of this is a staffing issue um you know is or it, it is that um yeah so how does that compare to i think our, our injury rate has uh, remained remained the, the same this is a labor intensive intensive business and it's a dangerous business and folks get get folks get hurt but i don't I haven't really I don't believe we've, we've had 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 a spike if if if, if you will I mean uh, we do uh, folks 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 get 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 nicked they they get hurt and they and they take it and 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 you know they 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 can't 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 come 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 to work but we've had a mix mix of that we've got I mean as 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 a COVID, COVID restrictions have been been re, 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 been been reduced. Uh, especially when uh, they they took the the, the math, mass man man mandate away away from from schools, a lot of our folks have kids, and the kids bring stuff home. And whether it's COVID COVID or not, we've seen an up an uptick in people just get, getting sick. And the smart smart thing is don't bring it in here because then it'll spread, spread, spread like wild, 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 wildfire. So that's a, that's a big part, part, part of this. Our injury, injury rate has not really in, has not really in increased that, 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 that much. That is a fear, fear, fear of mine. And I've stated, stated that in, in the past that, you know, not, 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 not in increasing our staff, staff, staff staffing could at some point increase our, our injury rate because you have less, less folks doing more, more work and being, and being, 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 being exposed to more, more hazards. So, so, so just go, going on that, um, well, my first question was we're, we're adding, we either, either are adding or have added for staff using ARP funds. Um, does that staff get you to a point where you, staffing is more adequate. Um, can you comment on your sense of with those four positions? How? Well, yeah. Well, those, well, those will, will, will help, but they're not going to help right, 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 right away. I mean, it, we've, we've got, got some, you know, it, it, it's going to, it takes at least a year, a year, you know, to get, get, get some, 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 someone full, fully trained, trained, trained up. And that's in, in-house for training and uh, the academy. So, and then there's the either the either the EMS side 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 of the house as well, and even with, with the, you know with, uh, those, those positions, uh, we 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 still have to have to fill 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 them. We just we just fin fin finish hire, hiring for those for those slots. Their first day is uh, Monday, but it took us a while to to hire hire hire. hire. Higher, higher folks, as you know, throughout 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 the world, world it's tough to bring to bring bring to bring in new 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 hires. The pool in our in our state in our area, 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 area is quite quite small, and we're not the only, the only game 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 in town. There are a lot of a lot of departments out there that, that are hiring right right now. So people have. You know, so so those can can, can candidates for it's a I guess it's a buy 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 buyers market mark, no sells 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 always mark, 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 market I guess uh, they can kind of pick pick and choose where 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 they they want they want to go and combine that with the fact that the that the pool of talent of qual qualified talent the talent talent is small 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 smaller it makes it makes it diff, diff, difficult to bring bring folks in and that. And that and and that in and that uh, take adds adds to the amount amount of time, you know, to get to get folks fo folks spun spun up. So the addition addition of the slot of the position is great, 
but it's it's going to it's going to take quite quite a while to re, re, re realize the benefits of that, and then add on to that that we're all ready behind the eight, the eight, eight, the eight ball now with folks that that, that are out. So, you know, uh, I won't say you know one you know one one step forward four, forward two two steps back, but it's it's you know right right now where we're trying to try to try trying to get to a, a, a stasis stasis point so and 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 it's the difficulty because it all takes time all you had something yeah i think the chief nailed it i mean we did add four new positions to this to the fire department budget that's a significant uh, addition to the department um 10 basically um, and that, that's, but as the chief said, it takes time. We had interviewed and the, the fire department had interviewed and selected six people to offer jobs to, um, four accepted, two didn't. So now we are going back out to find those other two slots we needed to fill. We were trying to get ahead of the, the curve because uh, the chief will, it was absolutely right that when you hire someone, they're not, if they start Monday, they're not really available to them until they get through the academy and do all the things that they need to do. And, and they just don't walk out and suddenly they're able to do the job. It takes a lot of time and this, the fire department has a very extensive, um, um, sophisticated training regimen they have for their new firefighters, which is that's why people appreciate the services that they get from the fire department. Um, but I think, you know, we're, you know, there's just a lot of turmoil, a lot of tr changeover, you know, people retiring, taking new jobs. It's just, we're, they're not immune to what's going on throughout the entire country. Um, and. And so just, we're just running to catch up and the quality of the staff we got, we're getting good people, but um, you know, they, they really, a lot of people have options too. And they choose not to, they choose, they're looking at different departments. Every department is hiring right now. So it's a really competitive marketplace as Tim said. Um, but um, you know, I think we're working as hard as we can. And I think, you know, we're, um, to get promotions filled and as people do retirements and we interviewed yesterday for promotions for captains, uh, but then that creates a new vacancy, right? Um, yep. As soon as we make that appointment and we can't, and so we're trying to get ahead of the curve with HR, but um, it's a, it's a tough world right now. And, and, and you know, I can, I'd, I'd be remiss if I did, did, the, didn't say kudos to the town for step, 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 stepping up and adding four new, Positions. I did, I did additional. I mean, this is some 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 something that's been a uh, hot top, top, topic since the before before I came. And the town town find found 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 a way a way a way, a way to step step up and add and add 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 those four. It's it it is a great step in the right 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 direction. I mean, I've I've said for ten to ten or twelve years that we we need we probably need. You know, in addition to those four, another four, 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 four to six, six more to get where 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 we need need need, need to be. But you can't do that over, over, overnight. It's not you know you uh, it it take it takes time. It takes it takes money. It takes it takes it it's it takes it takes a lot of work. But this is a great step in in the right right direction. So. Uh um, Andy, some of the other questions are asked are um, related to the trends and the data that I saw on it's on page 125 for fire EMS. Um, and rather than take time to go through that, um, I sent them in late. Um, but some of them, if we could get answers to a few of them, Sean, maybe later, and no one else has seen them, but examples are um, if we, it, how many of the, when EMS goes out, how many end up at the hospital where we can bill it and how many we don't, and I can sort of see it in the data, but how many of the non-billable went to Applewood and the Arbors for lift and assist, and at one point we talked about could we bill those to private insurance as a way of uh, avoiding an emergency trip. So some of them are finance related that we don't get paid for those trips. I think, um, I think uh, actually, I think to give, give a little back, background on that I, or, or, or some con context, I'd like to, like to ask sure. Assistant Chief Ohm, Ohm, Ohm's, Ohm said to jump, jump in, in here to kind of add some context to, to that because it's more than just data, data and, and numbers. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to answer the question regarding particularly Applewood and um, 
going to the Arbors. So COVID, COVID changed a lot of things. And one of the things that happened at um, the Arbors in particular is that once they figured out that people couldn't come from the outside and to help them, they had to become a little bit more self-reliant and figured out how to do lift assist on their own. So that was one of the uh, strange positives that comes out of, of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, we didn't do very many, we do some lift assist down, down at Apple, but not nearly the quite the same uh, format. And remember that when you're at, at Applewood, you basically live in your own place. And there's not really this type of staff that you have in the assisted living format at the Arbors. Those are, there are two different types styles of housing um, and two different levels of um, assistance that you're gonna get in, the, in those type of residents. Um, so they should, they'd be important to kind of separate those out a little bit. Um, was there another billable billing question that I could try well, to help with? Well, I was mainly looking that in the past, you know, and so it's post COVID is you're going to have, we're still in the moving from hopefully to post COVID, but my, my sense is that the ambulances were going out a lot without resulting in a hospital visit. And then you couldn't bill for that trip. Um, and I'm you know, just thinking in terms of billable and I remembered, so it may not be the, that at one point it was mentioned that there was uh, some discussion with Blue Cross or the insurers that if one of the things you were doing was basically doing home health care when you went out there and prevented, could you bill to insurance? So I'm looking at the revenue side of the department um, and I don't know where those discussions went. So those discussions would require us to do more home health care or specific home health care, and then try to figure out what the um, Medicare, Medicaid availability for funds would be. We don't really offer that service yet. It's, it's uh, prevention for EMS, and we haven't really ventured into that um, at this point. It is a staff driven um, idea. We would need more staff and we would need to do a little bit of extra training with that staff and some small but important diagnostic equipment that would go with that. If you looked at other, other services that provide those kind of um, mobile integrated healthcare um, across the state or even in other states. So right now that's in the idea mode, knowing that this is something we need to look to in the future, but we haven't started doing it currently. And, you know, when I met with Earl, uh, last week, these are things that we might be actually we're able to work together and share in some future uh, endeavors, uh, not unlike what we found when we got into the pandemic and we started working with uh, public health and we could be a, a force multiplier for public health when we got into the vaccine clinics, um, homebound visits and things like that. So we have the means, we have the capability. Um, if we're going to build something out, we would actually need to add some more staff that would be able to specifically work in those areas or more specifically work in those areas and still cover all the emergencies that we do now. Um, so I hope that answers most of your question. Yeah, it, it does. And then the other one is just my UMass related question. Uh, when I'm looking at the service levels, uh, what share of um, staffing trips of ambulance are related in any way to UMass? Um, but but we can come back, you know, ambulance trips, wear and tear on our vehicles. Um, there, it's a huge proportion of our population, and I'm not sure we get fully reimbursed for it. So that it is. Yeah. It is. I mean, we do, yeah, we do, we go to we go to you you mass quite 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 a bit, but you but in the in the in the trend trend trending, what we found is that you you mass. Does does grow, but at a very 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 slow rate each 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 year. Our our growth, our the largest amount amount of our growth in, in our call 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 volume is from is is from uh is from town and our sort of surround and the, the other town 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 towns we serve service. That's where most of our our most most of our growth growth is. So. Okay. So my request would just be, could we, we don't have those trends in this. So if we could get just something separate um, and it's not essential right now for the budget discussion, Sean, but I haven't seen that kind of trend report for a while. I, I saw the earlier studies when Hadley was leaving us 
Yeah. Um, so and Kathy, just, just to clarify, yeah. you want, um, we definitely have numbers on calls to the UMass campus, I, and, and Mike's still here, maybe Jeff knows this. I don't know if we have solid numbers on calls for students, which I think was oh. your, what you no, distinguished we, with the police when it's well, off campus. It's not, trans- not current ones, no, because, and, and please recognize that the, as Sean said, those numbers you see for UMass are on UMass campus proper. <laughs> they don't reflect going to Phillips or Allen or Nutting in that area. They are they are specifically on campus buildings and residents that, that we go to there. Jeff, yeah. we might be able to ballpark though. Um, I think in the past you've been able to look at age. We um, have, have done an we age have that. report. Yeah, we've okay. done an age-based report and then try to, to push out addresses that would push us into, you know, if it's on College Street, it's much more likely to be Amherst College. If it's on you know, West Street at 893 West Street, I know it's Hampshire College. It's it's those kind of things that you can do that are not super scientifically specific, but pretty, pretty close. And that's all I'm asking for. You know, I when the earlier ones you could see what was happening on Friday and Saturday night with the ambulance trips to the hospitals. And it may not have been to the UMass campus, but it was uh party or or yeah. You can extra, sort of extrapolate and say, well, yeah, this 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 was was a student student driven I'm call. Just, I'm just looking for any way we can start to document across our departments of the draw UMass has on our budgets. That's you know, so Sean, that's you know, I don't need that answer now. Right. Okay. And just to be clear, we do document very carefully the calls to UMass campus because yep. okay. that's how our um, our billing arrangement with UMass, our reimbursement arrangement with them works is based on calls to the campus. So we do have good numbers on that piece of it and, and trend on that. You know, I had one homebound elderly resident. Uh, uh, he's not alive anymore. He said he and his wife did the best they could never to fall or need help on Friday or Saturday because the, because the ambulances were too busy to come to them. So they would you, not that you can choose when when you need it. No, we're, but you know what? We're not too too busy to come to come. No, but, to, but I they mean, had, they just had a sense, and they. You're right. I, I understand it, and we and we we do a lot, a lot of work to let to let folks know that that it, that should not be a con- concern, sir, and sir, and theirs. We, I mean, if if it's not not us, we have a very ro- ro- robust mutual aid 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 system, and at the same same time. On, on 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 those busy, busy nights, we are still going to get advanced life support care from you know, from an Amherst fire 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 crew at at your side to take to take care to take take care care the issue. The am the am the ambulance to transport may come from from another town, but you're going to get paramedic care at your side from from Amherst fire 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 fire, fire, fire medics in a time 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 timely fa- fa- fashion so so let me um kathy can we move to the other two counselors and okay uh michelle thank you i noticed that the rescue responses which i think include motor vehicle calls have gone up from uh, 386 in FY18 to 848 in FY21. That just really, that stood out to me. And I'm just curious if something maybe has been added into that item that wasn't previously there, or if that's a true increase and what, what is, what's happening there. Oh, uh, a it is a true true in the in in increase, but I'll defer for for that and that to Jeff and Lynn, Lindsay to fill fill to fill it in. So there is a change. We we changed our how we dispatch and how many people we dispatch to certain types of calls. Um, March of twenty twenty actually. Um, so some of what you're seeing in that is the fact that. The overall fire responses reflect the actual number of times the fire truck is really going out for calls. And in the reporting system we use that goes to the state um, and to the national uh, agencies that collect it, that gets put into that rescue category. So that's why you're seeing it there. And what that means is to say we have a chest pain call, a shortness of breath, stroke, cardiac arrest, 
motor vehicle accident, unconscious over 30, um, a significant trauma. Um, we will send an engine with an ambulance. So hopefully what we're sending is up to five people to go take care of that situation that is critical right then, right there, and hope to stabilize it at the scene. The other thing that happens is that it allows for, by having more help uh, quicker, uh, we can take care of patients better. And you think about the people that you see these days, we're all sort of, uh, myself included, um, you know, we're a heavier generation than, than 20, 25 years ago. Uh, people are heavier to pick up and move. Our, even our stretchers, as nice as they are using hydraulics, are heavier to carry. And we bring a lot of equipment, defibrillators, bags uh, with us. So having four or five people to help you actually manage patient care, treating somebody, and then even extracting them out to the ambulance and all the equipment, having them there in that first 15, 20 minutes makes a big difference. So um, some of what you're seeing is reflective of the fact that we changed our or how we, how we dispatch and how many people we send to the initial call for help on certain types of calls. And, and Michelle, that's what the notable trend, not as um, detailed as what Jeff just explained, but that's what the trend is trying to um, state about the change in protocol. Can you just say, so uh, just so I make sure I understand, so is there, there's nothing that has really changed in terms of what's happening out there um, between FY 18 and FY 21. I mean, that's a huge increase. Um, so I'm just trying to understand why. It's a better reflection of sort of work done than we were compiling before. I see. Okay. So it's a matter it's a better of way. Way. it's a better way. There isn't necessarily a, we're not doing that many more car accidents or that many particular types of calls. It's sort of how we're handling those calls. Great. Okay. And how we're documenting those calls that has changed, but it gives you an overall look at, it doesn't tell you that we've done that many more fire alarms. It's telling you that we're doing that much work. And Perfect. if you had, for example, if you had two separate agencies, a fire agency and an ambulance agency, you would see that same kind of call trends. So if you were in Springfield that has two separate agencies, you would see those numbers. And yes, they go to a lot of the same calls. And this is, this is giving you an idea of sort of total work done. And, and, and you know, an and, and, and slave benefit, which is why, why we changed, is that uh, there's a study, study Jeff, Jeff, Jeff found, found, found some studies that show that the, out, the patient out out, out outcomes are better, better with the more more help the more help help you send you spread 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 the work you have a, a greater great greater number the number of, of of eyes on this is situation work work working to get 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 that better outcome the other the other piece pieces is that you spread, you spread, spread the work. You spread the weight. It means there's le there, there's less of a lesser chance for in, 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 in injuries. Uh, one one back in, in injury because you know you, you only have two two people move, move, moving a large pay, pay, pay patient can I mean it'd be besides besides sides of pain and inflicted on the individuals. There's there's you know the lot the lot the lot the loss loss of those, those folks for x, x amount of time or sur sur surgeries and that and that and that type type of thing which we've had here and part, one of the thing, things that that it's helped is the our our power powered stretch, stretchers that we've had now Jeff almost ten years oh, almost no. ten years almost, yeah. almost ten ten years uh, and that and that was dri dri driven by back back in 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 injuries and surge surge surgeries and just to spread 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 the work the work workload that means there's less there's going to be less, less stress on on uh, less physical stress on, on on our staff and means uh they're better able to you know to do the do the do the do our job so and just to, if i could just simplify it it what is happening what used to happen is we'd send an ambulance if there was a medical call now we send an ambulance with a fire apparatus with it. So we're sending two vehicles to a situation where we used to send one vehicle. And you're seeing with that, and that's that's based on the fire department's assessment that that's a safer, as they explained, they feel that that's a, a better way to respond to medical calls. Um, and that's why you're seeing that number, and that's where, where that number is being reflected under um, 
rescue calls. So, but instead of sending one vehicle, we're sending two vehicles to the same call. There's not more calls, more apparatus responding. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we, I want to keep moving along because I want to have some time also for Chris and uh, finish, so we can finish the meeting. Mandy. Yeah, so my questions actually relate to the same question because, um, and it goes to budget in that, you know, so one question I have is, are we the only town in the area sending these multiple vehicles to one call? Um, and are we the only town sending a fire apparatus as the second vehicle instead of another ambulance? And then as that relates to that, um, what is the cost on the capital to adding in a fire vehicle to all of these calls? Um, an extra 500 or 600 or so a year, it looks like, given some other numbers, somewhere between five and 600 a year. In terms of how long the vehicles will last, we already know that the fire department wants um, a high a quicker replacement schedule for our ambulances that that we've we're not on necessarily a um ideal replacement schedule for the ambulances but what kind of effect is this going to have on the fire apparatus too in terms of long-term costs to the town not just in terms of savings on maybe the operational side for injuries and all but um costs on the capital side for wear and tear on vehicles because they're on they're on calls more often and driving more miles. You're, you're going to see, yeah, I would say, yes, you're, you're going to see, see in, increase where, 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 where and tears if the truck, 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 the trucks are out or out more. That's a gig given. Uh, you, you, you're, we're going to add, add, we're going to add miles and that, and that type, type of thing. It means that uh, repair, repair costs are probably, probably going to going, going, going to, to increase in fuel, fuel costs. But we did, did this, because we want to make sure that we have good pay, patient, better pay, pay, patient out, out, out comes in the data. Data shows 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 that that, that that's what 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 happens. Yes, the the other the other benefits are going to be uh, low, uh, less less chance 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 of injury in 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 injuries to 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 our folks and that type of thing. But the dry dry the dry driving force behind this change was patient out better pay, pay, pay patient out 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 outcomes and you know i don't want to sound too dramatic but i will i guess i mean what what cost do 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 you put put on 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 that we're in the in in the business of take to take taking care of people the best way we can and this and this and this that this was one 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 of those, those ways and it was based on data data solid solid data, data. And you know, uh, Paul Paul like 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 likes to say that you know, in the, uh, Am 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 Amherst should be at the for forefront of in in innovation and that that type 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 of thing. And this is an example example of that. So, I'll just yes. I'll just add in because Mandy Joe, your first question. Um, in fact, <clears throat> locally between Northampton and East Hampton, which are two of the other larger. EMS agencies in Hampshire County, we were the last one to do this. Um, in fact, Northampton has been sending an engine for as long as I can remember. And East Hampton either sends a, a squad, um, but they, they're staffed a little, they're staffed less than we are and have to, to kind of manage their options a little bit differently. So we do this because we're doing both the uh, fire and EMS simultaneously. And sometimes that means that engine that's going away might have just one person on it. Sometimes it might be two people or it can be as much as three because um, they're always keeping their ear and eye out for the next call that's behind them. And, and so um, it's a way to use all the, the pieces as efficiently as possible. And Andy, if I can just add to that, we did ask, and what Jeff just said, we did ask, could we send a different type of vehicle um, to those types of calls? But, you know, Jeff felt that, you know, which I think we all thought made sense is if there's a call that comes in while they're assisting one of these calls, they want to be on the truck and ready to respond um, immediately and not have to drive back to a station to get into a you know different vehicle or to get a truck. Um, so that's why having an alternative type of vehicle might not work. And the last piece I'll add to this is that there was an AMR, uh, an ambulance, large ambulance service. If you're not familiar with AMR, they're a nationwide ambulance services. And one of their data points is that a back injury 
costs an average of about sixty thousand uh, dollars. Significant back injury is worth about sixty thousand um, dollars. So for a company that is you know labor intensive and we spend ninety percent of our all of our money is on personnel. Um, so I think just for relativity's sake, when you rel when you put that out against fuel costs and even maintenance costs. Um, those back injuries really add up and they, they hit us in multiple ways. No, thank you for that. I just request next year for capital planning that that, that data be sort of translated into what a new replacement schedule might need to look like given the change in practice. Um, and then Andy, if I could have your indulgence for one more thing, I forgot to ask my other question, which is this do budget document talked about community paramedics um, and changing from an EMS response to a community paramedic response and how that might cost um, or so could you talk a little bit more about what the difference between that is and the reason for changing from one type of service to another and, and I might be describing it wrong because I don't actually understand what it's talking about but it was in the key challenges long range objectives I think is where it was um, you know to assess the implications of how the EMS transition to community paramedicine will impact activity level in the way the town delivers EMS and I just didn't can, can you talk more about that and the cost and what, what those differences are? So th this gets a little bit into Kathy's question earlier when we talked about sort of that, how, how we might be able to bill for it. The community paramedicine is, is essentially doing preventative uh, EMS care in the same way we use fire prevention and try to, to decrease fires and in, in, you know, rescue responses in town. So sort of apply that same principles and how we could, um, do less perhaps emergency transports to hospitals, which in the healthcare world costs, you know, infinitely large amounts and increasing amounts of money every year. How do you prevent those? And this trickles down all the way to the local EMS agencies. Can you go to houses and do uh, wound care um, that sometimes has been covered by other things? Can you do uh, post-surgical uh, follow-ups and, and be able to have dialogue with primary care doctors looking for alternative locations to take patients? So that's really the sort of the heart of the mobile integrated healthcare effort statewide. Um, and we know it's coming down the road. We're just not sure where we're going to intersect with it and how to intersect with it yet. Um, and what it would take is, is using our paramedics Strangely enough, a number of our paramedics have started uh, going to nursing school. Um, it's a little bit different skill set, but you know, an increased level of um, knowledge you know, that they bring with them when they come to work um, based on their education. And how can we use that to do less transports to, the, to an emergency department that may not be able to always help them? You heard us talk early with Earl um, and Scotty talking about, you know, Emergency departments are not really built well for mental health cases. They're not built well for substance abuse cases. Uh, we need to look at different models in the future to try to take care of folks. Thank you. Um, need to move it along, Dorothy. Uh, just a very quick question, though. It's true that uh, the budget, the finance hearing is more the most interesting meeting of several weeks. OK, this has been very, very informative. Um, what is unconscious over 30 mean? That was a... So an story. unconscious patient, a patient that's not responsive, but we know in our demographics with the student population we take care of that alcohol and being unconscious is not an uncommon call response mm -hmm. that we go to say for college students, Friday and Saturday nights in particular. We're not sending an engine to every one of those because we know we can manage them because of our experience in taking care of them. Largely, we can manage those with a two-person single ambulance, as opposed to, you know, the rest of us in this room. Mm -hmm. If you're unconscious, there's probably a significant medical reason for that, and we want to take care of that. Um, it's probably not just about alcohol. So we send more help to do more work um, than we would probably need to do for the unconscious 18-year-old male at a certain dorm on campus. Thank you. Thank you very much. What, and what, what, what that, and one thing we, we didn't talk, talk, talk about was that when, when, when we send in this digital engine to a call, we, we have a set of uh, cry, cry, cry criteria, criteria that we use that where where we will just send only, only an 
ambulance or an ambulance and a and an, and an engine. So, so we again we uh, and this this dis, dispatch has has that. So it's a set. We 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 we've come, we came up came up came up with criteria criteria to dict to dictate what what level 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 will uh, send send to to a call. So I'll make my pitch to uh, you know that the police department brought up changing out IMC. Um, and change it to a different dispatch format. One of the limitations of this old IMC format is it really can't help us tell you exactly how many of these um, co-response type calls there are and how they go out just because of their limitations um, on the IMC side. So um, I'll make my pitch that if there's money in the future finance capital to, uh, to go after that, it would help us as well. Lynn? So, first of all, I want to really appreciate the fact that two, actually three, because Anna had to leave, of our counselors who are on JCPC have been part of this meeting and the ability to ask the kinds of questions they've asked, particularly as it relates to the use of engines and the whole area of replacement schedules and so forth. And so I just want to acknowledge that and say that it's a perfect example of where uh, some counselors get into areas much more deeply and then they bring it to other discussions. And so Kathy, Mandy Jo, and Anna, who had to leave, thank you for doing that. Um, so I really wanna ask about reimbursement and uh, insurance because clearly being one of those aging members of the Amherst population, I want the best health care out there. And if you make a difference between my living because you were able to get to my home with better equipment and better trained people, um, and if I didn't need to go to the hospital or you were able to get me there but still save me, I, I appreciate all that. How much of my insurance, what is my insurance going to re reimburse for those two vehicles, for those additional people and so forth. And part of the reason I'm looking at that is because that money is part of what goes in then to buying the new equipment. And if we need to be looking at new healthcare models that we as, an, or as a town decide, you know, like CVS has become, you know, a healthcare hub. If we're gonna be getting into those new models, I'd like us to make sure that we look at the um, financial relationship of those models to the model itself and our ability to pull it off and maintain it. Because what I'm hearing is a sea change. It's an exciting sea change, but I'm worried about the finances. So the reason those things changed, at least particularly nationwide, is really about money. It's about insurers. So for perspective, about 52% of the folks that we transport from the Amherst Fire Department, and this, this is similar across a large portion of Hampshire County. Honestly, it was similar numbers in Hadley and, and my folks in Northampton have similar demographics. About 52% are covered by Medicaid, MassHealth, or Workman's Comp, which means those are structured formats for reimbursement. So Lynn, if we come to your house tonight, we take you to the hospital and we charge you $3,000. Yep. Medicare is going to give us about 450 bucks. So when, if you have constituents who come to you and say, how come the ambulance costs are so expensive? It's largely about reimbursement. And it's about the fact that half the people we take care of have a fixed amount of reimbursement. And that doesn't mean that the other 48% are all on private insurance. Insurance is changing. So I talked to a gentleman yesterday who we took care of his wife back in December and he was very happy with the care. But he got this bill for $2,300 and wanted to know why it was so expensive. And I point him in the direction of, we use that money, about $2.2 million in fees. Most of it comes from ambulance fees to help cover the operational budget of the department and to make sure that services are available. Um, so a lot of folks that we might take care of in the preventative side probably live in a fixed insurance format that we get limited money for. So if you're a mass health, we're probably if you're a mass health patient, we're probably getting two hundred and fifty dollars for that transport, regardless of what it costs us. If we take care of a Medicare patient, it's probably for between three fifty and four fifty, depending on what 
you're signed up for. And if you're Medicare A versus Medicare B, Medicare A doesn't even cover ambulance services. So that becomes bill patient. And if you're Medicare B, they probably want a copay um, that goes with it. So this actually is looking at it from a financial standpoint as much as anything else, because we're really limited in what we can uh, receive from patients that have those fixed um, insurance formats. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I really appreciate that other side of that one. Okay, other questions? Well, then I want to thank um, all of you from the fire department uh, who've uh, stuck with us for such a long period of time. We really appreciate it. It's been very informative and I think will help us, but also as has been pointed out, uh, when we get back to the capital budget. So it wasn't just about operating budget, but uh, Tim Lindsay, Jeff, thank you so much for having spent the time with us this morning. And uh, thank you for all that you do in the community and to right. be at our side when we need you. Not a problem. So, um, I think that we want to do um, is try and finish uh, public safety and uh, let uh, Earl for the first time uh, meet the finance committee, meet with the finance committee and uh, tell us uh, a little bit about your perspective on the budget for your department and see if there are any questions that come your way. Yeah, this is uh well, this is a scary part of the job I didn't anticipate, uh, but I'm excited for it nonetheless. Um, accomplishments are pretty pretty small. I've only been here a couple months. Um, our main focus has been relationships. Um, this is a, a town that is a real community, and uh, you know, I and the folks who join this team will need to do the legwork to make sure that we are good neighbors, good citizens, good partners. Uh, before we can ever do a response that's meaningful, we need to demonstrate that we care about this place. And um, I want you to know that I care about this place. Um, I have been supported greatly by everyone. Um, the budget that Paul has put through is um, absolutely gonna meet our needs. And I think more importantly, I've heard a lot of folks um, in the last couple of days question if I could get support if I need it. And I have no doubt of that. Um, I have no doubt that when things have come up and I've needed something, uh, as far as a communication system, uh, Michael and, and Tim and Scott have dropped what they were doing to make things work for me. Um, they have been incredibly supportive. Um, we're in implementation. Well, we need to stand up. Um, so uh, what you may expect from us next year is that we will make sure we do things in a way that moves um, mindfully and is trying to solve actual issues. So um, kind of as opposed to saying what we think are challenges at the schools, we're gonna spend times at the schools and learn from the folks who are there. Um, we're at the senior center. I, I painted some tulips poorly. Uh, I wouldn't put it on my resume, but but really, you know, that sort of thing is, is really important. And, um, you know, we have a lot of sweat equity to put in before we before I'll be here asking for more. Um, but we are going to grow and, and we will we will someday need more. And uh, I, I feel comfortable asking for it when the time is. But right now, um, it's, it's time for us to work. We will. Kathy, I didn't know if you had uh, done anything or anything. No, I actually, um, Earl, if you, what you just to lead into my only question, because as you said, I couldn't read in the thing, but the sense that you're building teams, even if they're not sitting next to you with uh, dispatchers, with EMS, what I just heard with um, this notion of paramedics, um, I. You know, in, and I just keep thinking of some international models that that deliver care differently and are using the social service mental health in combination. So um, I just have to say welcome because I think that kind of thinking is what's going to put um, do us all well and 
painting tulips at the senior center sounds like a perfect way to meet seniors to me. So I mean, it's this you know sense of you're out there and been very visible. So I guess the only question I have is because you were in the news with working with the school system, and we just heard that the police don't. Um, is your sense that uh, potentially that will be a role for Cress um, over time? Oh, absolutely. It already is. Um, so I chaperoned the middle school dance a couple weeks ago. Uh, what a time to be alive. Um, I'll be helping the chaperone at the high school at the prom a uh, week from this Friday. Uh, we are going to be working with some um, students who have volunteered to be kind of active bystanders uh, at the school next year. We're going to provide them some training over the summer. They're going to participate with CRESS. Uh, we're working with Summit Academy um, to build up some capacity in, in those youth. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I identify a lot with those those young folks so wanting to make sure that they feel is is um supported in this town as i have been is important um and really working across all of them some of the the most important things we've done there really has been just giving folks a break um the school staff are, are all really stretched so one of the things we're planning for next year is that crest will have some role in helping with the cafeteria um with holding a lunchroom at the middle school not just because it gives them a break, but it gives us a chance to meet the students there, to shake hands, to get to understand where they're coming from. Um, so we're thinking of ways in which we can solve problems kind of across systems while also providing an additional resource and, and getting a chance to meet folks. So um, we're gonna be really busy at the school and, and grateful for it. Uh, those are our future residents of this town and they should get the full benefit of this immediately. Mandy? Thank you. Um and you know, I, I want to say say to you, Earl, um, that everything you said today, including when we were discussing police department, and all sounds fantastic. The building up of the system and not wanting to overburden the new responders as you hire them, and sort of building them. It sounds like to when they become sort of the supervisors and can train the next sort of set of hires and all. Um, so I, I, I think everything sounds great. I do have a couple of questions about funding and some of these might be for Paul more than you. Um, will some of the services that you provide be reimbursable by Medicaid or Medicare? And if so, um, are we intending to aim for those reimbursements? Um, and then the next one is with your work with the schools. I wholly support that work, um, but I ask this of DPW regularly, one of our schools is a regional school that gets funding from not just our town, but three other towns. Um, and then there's also the school budget itself, which is just another line item in our larger budget that we're looking at right now. And how are those funds distributed between them? Is there going to be sort of a charge back to the, the regional school for the services that you're going to be providing them? Um, you know, and all of that. It, it's not to say I don't want you providing the services, but you know, um, I ask it when we do the DPW does the maintenance and the lawn care. How do we as a town sort of receive the benefit of the fact that that school system has three other towns paying into it? Um, and so that maybe that could subsidize some of this program. And that might not be a question you can answer. That might be more for Paul or Sean. Um, but are we looking at for those cross departmental services um, a way to particularly for the regional schools um, receive funding from the regional schools for that. I want to answer that first part because the second part I'm wholly unqualified for. Uh, but the first part is, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're working with state providers. We're having conversations about um, what billing would look like. How could we be eligible? It's a very complicated thing. It takes a long time. Um, and certainly, I mean, we the good thing is I know the folks there, so we're going to have honest conversations about, you know, would that be a replication? Um, we are we are having active conversations with everyone who might benefit from our resources about how we can share. You know, this is a partnership. Obviously, we're the new kids, so we will be expending most of the energy at the beginning. Uh, but give us a year or two in the value we add. I, I think folks won't have a problem contributing back. And, um, and I also know that there's some behavioral health things coming down the road um, in the next two or three years around who's eligible for Medicaid billing that will be incredibly valuable. So um, I guess more to be continued and hopefully this is my last round of unsatisfying answers. Pretty soon there'll be work. Uh, Paul, please say, or anyone else, the, the second part. Yeah, so I think a big piece of um, the way we've conceptualized this, is, which is different than Northampton and other communities is that this is a, a third leg of public safety. 
So along those lines, we don't charge the schools if the police respond or the fire department responds. I mean, if there's going to be a steady ongoing relationship that we're going to have someone stationed there from Crest or there's going to be, we might look at that as a partnership with the school. But again, I think it's really important for us to, and Earl and, and it is, I think one of the things that has been really powerful about the development of this program, why it's getting so much attention is that it has been super cooperative among the three agencies. I mean, Earl deserves a lot of credit, but I also think, you know, Mike Curtin, it, it, this could have gone in a lot of different directions. It's going in a really positive direction because of the leadership in our police and fire agencies and the dispatch because they're saying, okay, the town wants this. How do we build it to the best that we can? And they're very professional about doing that. Um, and so I think you know, we want to continue to look at this as a public safety lens. I've had the conversations with Northampton. They look at it as a public health lens and they're looking really different. It's a, it's a direct, you know, very different approach. So I think CSWG, and that was a mind opening uh, uh, moment for me when they said, no, we really see this as public safety. And so we're, that's the path we're walking down. And I think that that's a pretty good path for us to explore right now. Though I do feel like, uh, let me just, uh, with the regional school question, um, our neighboring communities need to have a better understanding of what it is that we provide to schools and public safety when they start complaining about the assessment method. Mary, there, have, you... there have been folks uh, from some of the surrounding towns who started the process of reaching out to learn about Crest, what the process was like and um, understanding our capacity. So I don't think it's a conversation that, I just think uh, you, you all know this better than anybody. It takes a while to wrap your head around it. Mandy, you have anything else I can ask Pam because we're really running close. I'm good, and thank you for that note, Andy, about um, maybe we need to work with our regional school committee to start identifying all those areas um, that the town provides that don't show up in the budget. Pam? Hi, thanks, and thanks to Earl for being here, uh, and thanks to Paul for hiring him. Um, I was looking, I was trying to find a number for training, training costs as you go forward. And I'm wondering if you have some sense of, of dollars that will be needed for training. Secondly, what kind of training do you envision and, and who provides that kind of thing for you? I know this is hypothetical, but it needs to be in the plan. This isn't hypothetical because uh, we're we're planning we're scheduling those trainings right now. I would say the dollars, Sean. I may default to you, defer to you on the the dollars piece of it. Who's doing our training? Um, we put a priority on folks who have uh, a mission that lines up with Crest, so that has uh, equity, uh, has some experience around public safety, um, and and understands how to to train folks to work with communities. Um, we're working with the Wildflower Alliance, which was a recommendation of the LEAP report. Um, we're working with the CRG uh, community uh, community conflict resolution group out of Springfield, um, who work with folks in the criminal justice system to to support folks in the community. They have just a really really thoughtful, well done way of um, dealing with concerning situations and things that may feel dealing with your own internal biases about someone else's action, which feels really important. Um, NVC nonviolent communication. We're actually getting that training from two town uh, residents. Um, Jay Levy uh, from Elliott Homeless Services is offering uh, is is providing our housing training or working with houseless folks training. Um, and then we've basically anywhere we've been able to find a content expert, we've gotten one. Um, the other thing that feels really important is we're getting first aid. We 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 are public safety. So we want to make sure that we also have the same fundamental training as public safety so that when we show up, even if we're not going to play those roles, we understand what they're looking for, what they're assessing for. Um, so we'll have a lot of, um, you know, what we call live drills. We're going to bring in folks to role play things and we're going to kind of practice what we're doing and then build training. I, I wrote this uh, uh, the other day, we're going to train, practice, train, and then work. And so when you see us take a deliberative step, it's because um, we, we want to make sure, you know, sometimes if you're trained off just a little, people do what they're trained to do. And if you're trained incorrectly, then you'll, you'll work incorrectly. So we're, we're really um, at the intersection of that. We're also open to any ideas. 
um, training uh, like like our public uh, safety uh, sister agencies is going to be kind of a regular and consistent part of what we do. Uh, so the training will never stop. The two months uh, will come to a close at some point, but every we're, we're planning to have one day where everyone's in so we can have a bit of an in service. Bernie. Hey, Sandy. Um, Earl, welcome to Amherst. It's nice as somebody with the background in human services, it's nice to see somebody who's got some extensive street level as well as management experience in, in, uh, in human services and DMH. I appreciate all that. Uh, questions for you is around the operating expenses. Uh, $13,000 doesn't seem to be a real robust amount of money. And I'm wondering how much of your current operating budget is actually off off budget because it's it's grant funded. Um, the other question is, is and I'm glad to see you, you, you've made repeated reference to the uh, LEAP uh, report, which is, I thought was pretty informative and had some excellent ideas in it around staffing and training. Um, <clears throat> have you given any thought at this point to um, what you might do uh, uh, for respite services um, or uh, to secure a, a, a quote, mental health bed um, given the, the, the population would be working with and uh, have you given any thought to a case management role for, uh, for uh, Crest? Oh, there's all right if I answer the part I can answer first and then you may yeah, go, get, go right ahead. Yep. You can get all budgety. Um, so uh, yes, um, trying to get that second part down, right? Um, so we are looking at some grants um, DMH has recently opened some grants up to us uh, to make us eligible for them, which is, is wonderful. And I think happened in a larger context uh, for things like living room programs, uh, drop-off centers, things like that. Uh, we're also um, kind of actively working as a stakeholder with state agencies to increase their access. Um, and, you know, really, I think you, you hit a really key piece the, a huge part of the mental health crisis in Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts in particular, is the lack of beds, um, is the reality that people are often needing to be moved across the state. Um, so we, we are, um, it, that's going to take time. Um, there's a new safe havens program opening up. There's a couple of them. Uh, there's more funding for them. We're going to make sure we have a real role over those, particularly in getting folks back and forth from Amherst. Uh, the case management question, I'm really glad you asked that one. Um, we have within our current contract um, providers who can do some kind of longer case management. But as far as targeted, goal specific, the sort of case management that um, that that is, I think, uh, more time limited, we do expect to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, for instance, someone uh, is on the streets looking for some support, getting into a, a place, but then kind of meeting their basic needs for a month or two. Those are things that we anticipate being able to do. Um, and it's part of the reason why I know the 911 calls are kind of it's it's easy to, to to spend a ton of time on that, but actually, if all we do is respond to crisis, then we're just chasing our tail forever. So we're really trying to think of how can the follow up be something that provides some immediate sort of wraparound, a handoff to services that's meaningful, but also a warm connection back. If that person ends up in crisis again, we're hoping that they'll be able to call us directly. They'll have a number we can show up, um, and so. You know, we're, we're, we really want to get upstream, which is the direction the department and the state are going. Um, as long as we kind of keep meeting folks on their worst day, it's really hard to prevent those issues moving forward. So, um, and the good thing is I have a lot of really good mentors and uh, there's no shortage of folks offering good ideas here. So um, I, am, I am not, uh, I recognize that I'm not the, I do not have a monopoly on a good idea. So if you, if you have any thoughts, Bernie, I'm here for them now and I'll be here for them later. Thank you. And I'll just add quickly the, the 13,000 in the operating budget. We knew that would be a starting point. And so this year we'll work with Earl and find out what that needs to be on an ongoing level. Um, for this first year, we have both the DPH grant and the ARPA grant, which large portions of those funds are earmarked for training. Um, and to the mental health piece, one of the things we are working or uh, we will be working with Earl and Jen Brown is that we have an allocation from ARPA for $500,000 for mental health. Um, and it's to do some of the things that you described. And so we'll work with um, those two who are experts on how to best utilize those funds. Yeah, that, that, that's great because uh, I, I think 
Earl's right on target when he said, if we don't, if we just don't want to keep going in circles. Uh, you, you know, you don't, you, want, you don't want frequent flyers. You want to be able to encounter somebody to uh, do the work you need to do with them and then get them into uh, a, safe, a safe place in terms of services, place to live. Uh, that's one of, I think that's one of the reasons why everybody refers to cahoots. I think one of the reasons why White Bird Clinic has been so successful is because they, they're a full service shop. Um, you know, we neither, uh, Northampton will have to explore this as well. I, and I don't think there's uh, uh, Ithaca's exploring this kind of thing. Uh, you, you know, there's a number of communities that are looking at it and being able to connect people up with services in a meaningful way and maintain a contact with them so that they know where to go if they start feeling uncertain um, is, is going to be real important. So thank you. And hey, well, I just, uh, I just want to offer us. It's not, just us, <laughs> it's not just us reaching out. We're getting calls from folks uh, all around the country at this point with new sorts of referral systems. Uh, we're working with an agency now that can do same day medical assisted uh, treatment uh, prescriptions for folks where um, I, I think a lot of our challenges, there are folks way outside of Amherst thinking about solving them with us and uh, we're gonna build a real network here and, and, and I'm excited. I'm, I'm, but, if you guys, take nothing away from this i'm still very excited <laughs> oh, and we're you. glad you are uh, yeah we michelle i really appreciate that excitement earl um i think we all are and uh so i have a comment and a question uh my question sort of related to the thirteen thousand dollars in the operating budget which i heard it was sort of a start um my question is, how are we doing with recruiting the community responders? And given this is such an innovative program and department and we're sort of um, leading the way in this, um, are there ways that if recruitment is not going as you hoped that we could be marketing in different ways or finding ways to um, get the word out about this in different channels that maybe weren't initially considered. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it's easy to be radical until you have to go out and do it. And I think that's the thing we're facing. I think there's a lot of people on paper who would like to be here, but it comes down to the reality. I, can't promise folks that they, I, I can promise them this won't be easy work. This is going to be challenging work. Um, it the shifts are going to be long. Um, I, I think you all heard Chief Nelson talk, uh, Chief Livingstone talk about you don't necessarily get to pick your days off, um, and, and you can be asked to fill in more. Um, we're getting good candidates. Um, I would say we're not getting huge numbers of candidates, but the people we're getting are good. Uh, I'm proud of the amount of internal candidates we're getting, of people from this town who have seen this process who want to join us, um, and people who work in, in human services who want to join us. Um, some of it is, I think, this is the scariest part possible. It was scary for me to think about joining this, because I don't know what it looks like. None of us will know until we start taking calls. So uh, we're balancing uh, trying to make it attractive. And I think it is attractive. The pay is certainly attractive uh, in the context of, of what human services pay. Um, the fact that it's a union uh, a pension position is meaningful. Um, I think it'll be easier when we start going and I can say, well, this is what the work looks like, or you could come do a ride along and see it. Um, I, I give tours in that kind of uh, space without a carpet all the time, just trying to have people see my vision. Um, but once there's something there, if you know anybody, if anybody knows anybody, I have found that it's, it's much easier when we can have an individual conversation with someone about what are they, their skills at and, and really telling people that we want to we want people. So the things you're good at, we want to make sure we empower you. We did, we did, uh, you know, we, we were ultimately able to find someone for a program assistant. And without, you know, getting into the details of that person, it is an incredibly competent, qualified person who, you know, if tomorrow I, I couldn't make it in, would be capable of leading this department. Um, I heard someone say eight supervisors. You know, my goal is that we have 10 directors, that as these programs pop up, that there are folks coming from the Amherst Crest Department to, to start these. I don't think this is the last one, uh, but I do think we get to be first. And, and that's a real, so whoever, there's a, uh, maybe it's apropos since we just hired someone from Notre Dame, uh, that those who stay will be champions. I believe that. 
And thank you, Earl. And just one comment. Um, in this conversation, it sort of became clear to me that there are maybe a lot more services that you envision Crest being able to provide. Um, and I think as a council, it would be really good for us to stay sort of on top of that and, and, and or, or at least um, sort of be aware and abreast to um, those uh, as, as, as the program evolves and expands and the ways that we can think about it. Um, I can imagine that sort of getting lost on us and then, oh, you know, so I just, I'm, I'm really saying that I think to Lynn and, and fellow counselors is just like for us to really be aware of um, all of the ways that, uh, that the community can be served by the Crest Department. I realized I, I skipped one part of your question, Bernie. I just want to circle back to it. Uh, the LEAP report is like the Bible. I read it like twice a week. Um, I really, I, I appreciate that that was put together. Uh, people across the state read that. Um, I meet with the LEAP folks uh, two to three times a month. Uh, they're going to continue to be involved in our world. Um, and now we're helping them to provide support to other towns that are considering this. Um, one of their recommendations was that they come back at some point to do another evaluation. And that's something we're kind of in the very early early stages of, of discussing. So um, we certainly won't, we're, we're gonna start a lot of new work, but we won't give up uh, good work that's already happened. I, thank you for that. I would encourage uh, uh, all the members of the council to uh, to read that uh, Amherst Community Responder Report. I think it was really well done. It's got a lot of good ideas and a lot of the questions that are coming up um, and there are a lot of suggestions to, to respond to them. And thank you, Earl, for, uh, for affirming that. Okay. I see no other hands in the council and we really need, or, or the committee, and I think we really need to move it along to conclusion. I need to do just one or two things. One is that uh, officially I need to uh, ask whether there's any members of the public in attendance who wish to be recognized for public comment. Uh, and uh, I don't, I think the answer is going to be probably not. But I, I do need to ask, and of course, public comments always welcome. So if I don't see hands go up, um, I'll keep an eye out for a hand up. But I would go on to the other couple of comments that I have so we can conclude and adjourn. Um, the other thing I related to public comment is I said this earlier, just for the benefit of our resident members. There were a number of written public comments that came in in relation to yesterday's hearing that um, I, we're going to work to figure out a mechanism to get them to you in the most efficient manner so that you have the benefits of the written public comments that the councilor member, council members of the committee have. And uh, uh, we, um, Athena is, is working with us to find the most efficient way to get that done. Um, another thing that I just wanted, two other things that I want to note is that um, I think that there's an issue that has to do with public safety that we really haven't addressed that was extremely evident in all of that written public comment as well as in public comment that we received during the hearing itself in verbal form and that is uh, people questioning the judgment in that was behind the town manager's recommendation on how to fund the various arms of the public safety budget. Uh, and in particular, uh, making assertions that we were inadequate, that he was recommending inadequate funding for crests and too much funding for police, to be blunt about it. Um, we have not had the opportunity and did not really get into that issue today. Um, I think when we get to discussing as a finance committee, our recommendation to the um, council on the budget, we may need to make some reference to that and some findings on it. And um, I don't know if anyone, uh, either 
Paul or Earl, or uh, I'm not expecting any comments from anybody today about it, but it is sort of this uh, elephant that's out there in the room and we can't, I'm not sure that we can totally ignore it when we come back. So um, the last thing that I- I just uh, want to say, which is, we're going to be standing up. We're going to need all the resources we can get. Um, so I, you know, whatever that means for folks, I just want to say that like we have had great partnerships with our other public safety uh, agencies, and we're going to need that for the next year. So just for your consideration. And I appreciate that, and we will. Um, I think the committee does is going to have to have that conversation as to whether that they want to respond to that in its report to the council. Um, and the uh, last thing that I just wanted to say again for the benefit of our resident members who weren't uh, just didn't stay with the entire council meeting yesterday after the hearing was over uh, is that um, there was a referral that we are going to um, need to take up not during the budget season but pretty quickly afterwards, which was the request of the uh, African um, Heritage uh, Reparations Union to talk about um, marijuana re revenue and uh, assuring that and, and their recommendation that marijuana revenue go to reparations fund. And that was referred to the Finance Committee and um, is going to be um, something that we will need to work into our discussions um, once we complete the budget discussions. Um, but I wanted to make you aware of that referral. So I don't have anything else today. Um, that was my one thing that I was referencing at the beginning that was a, uh, within the last 48 hours, probably more like in the last, in the 12 previous hours, but um, in any event, um, I'll turn it to Lynn and Kathy since your hands are up and then and Michelle, but let's try and be real quick because uh, we are after 12 o'clock already and I want to get us adjourned, but Lynn. Lynn, you don't have anything then? Do. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to see if I should adjourn the council. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, oh, no, we still have seven. Yes, I want to ask a clarification on the assignments for Thursday. I have DPW, but I've, it was a little unclear to me whether I also have the enterprise funds. Yes, I believe you took all of them. Um, so I have everything yeah. for Thursday. Yes, I did. Right. I did warn to split them up. Don't forget, I did warn that. Okay. But, but you want to? Um, thank you. I just want to invite counselors uh, individually to send me any questions they have. Okay. Yeah, and I do want to remind people that on Thursday, um, I will uh, be a, uh, convene the meeting at the beginning, but immediately turning it over to Kathy, who's going to be chairing. Um, the, in, in managing the entire meeting um, once we have uh, started the meeting. So just say that again. Kathy. Uh, that, that was actually what I was going to say. Andy has asked me to chair next Thursday. So in addition to Lynn's request that she amalgamate, and I didn't make that with the police EMS, uh, I, didn't share, I didn't share the questions I sent. Yeah. Sean, but I would like, I, my request would be is you get a composite. Could you, could we see them maybe at the beginning of the meeting? So we just know what has already been asked. Um, and I don't know what the, it's, you don't need to answer it now. Cause I just, Mandy was waiting to see if I would ask something. I had a couple things on the list that I didn't go into. Um, it just, it would be useful um, if Lynn, I will send you whatever I have, but I'm going to be chairing it. So that was my only uh, just comment. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle. 
Yeah, following up on assignments, um, I have general government, which I realize is really big. Um, and I want to make sure I get my questions in as far enough in advance as possible so that perhaps even we can have written answers um, for prior to the meeting. I think um, general government is a week from today. So just asking if counselors have any questions um, to please send them to me as, as Lynn did. Um, and I also wanted to say to Andy, and I can't see you now. Oh, Andy, um, I did send the public comment with respect to the uh, AHRA's request to our non-voting members, um, what I had so far, as well as the memo that I wrote for counselors. Um, but I really appreciate that there's a, 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 something in the works that will make that a little bit easier as we move forward with, with that discussion um, and any discussion that the non-voting members might want to have public comment for. So thank you. Yeah, and, and I want to thank you for having uh, made that forward. It saves me one step because my next thing would have been after the uh, meeting adjourned today to go through what we had yesterday in the packet and uh, see if there's anything that needs to be forwarded to them. And uh, you've taken care of a piece already, so thank you. Um, so no hands up. There's nothing else that I'm aware of on the agenda. Um, and uh, before I, I guess I'll declare the meeting adjourned. <laughs>